All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I don't really know how to best go about this, per se. Um, I know there was some requests. Um, kind of put up a question announcements that if it would help if um, I made a video on new to mid-level players about how to play Hoi 4, being that I have a decent amount of hours, about 1,800 at this point in Hoi 4. Help some of you guys out, learn a couple steps, um, learn a few things along the way, just kind of help you get better at Hoi 4, because that's one of the main reasons I host Hoi 4 games, to try to get better, you know, help get people better at Hoi 4, um, help people learn more about the game, um, and be able to do a lot more difficult things than they would be able to do before, just because the game has so many interesting aspects of it. But anyway, let's just get started. Just a basic Germany run. Um... I just so I know what's going to happen, I guess. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to break down everything. It's going to be a long video. I'm going to break down literally everything you see in the menu. Strategies, micro, um, try to do air. I think I'm going to leave Navy or something separate. I won't lie to you guys. I'm not the best at Navy. I think it's going to be really crucial that um, I have somebody that knows a little bit more about Navy. Um, why do you guys? I was really good at Navy before the Man the Guns patch. Man the Guns came out, um, and I'm lost. So... Let's start by breaking everything down. Um, first of all, you will see that most of the stuff is going to be in the top part of the screen. If anything, this stuff right here, it seems to be at a minimum at all times. Um, you want to get rid of everything you can up here to be a good Hoi 4 player. You always want to be researching, always want to be building, always want to have military factories on something. Most situations, you always want to have natural focus set. You want your divisions to be training, or in some cases, this is not that important You know, to like conserve. Uh, your division to being trained. You always want to make sure your equipment's always up to date. You want to always have your divisions assigned. Um, decisions, there's a lot of decisions. You can uh, usually play with a lot more, but some of them, like canceling MIFO bills with Germany, is not really a good option just because of the bonuses it gives you. But that's my first tip. Really easy tip is try to have as least, the least amount of stuff you can here. You don't want to leave this just sitting here. Um, turn the music down just a little bit. All right, so let's start off. We'll go left to right, stuff up here. Um, first, if you press Q or if you click your flag in the top left, you are gonna see your political stance. There's a lot of information here, breaking down bit by bit. Obviously your leader's right here, you mouse over them, you're gonna see different bonuses or debuffs that'll give some are good. Extra political power gain. Some, you know, again, extra political power gain, political advisor cost minus, um, bad one might be Manchuko, I believe. No, uh, where's the bad one? Uh, that one's really good. Ah, uh, yeah, like negative political power gain, but plus stability. Again, there can be good or bad modifiers to each person you get in charge of your nation. Um, you'll also see in this tab, you'll have national spirits. Um, a lot of times you'll start with bad national spirits, especially depending on what country you are. Um, and they usually change through focuses or decisions. For instance, France, which is a nation that is crippled by them, has political violence which causes a lot of different tumultuous um, actions to happen in their country, insufficient economy, full employment, a lot of bad stuff that, that you have to go into their tree and get rid of. So a lot of tree searching for this one that you have to figure out where exactly you can get rid of a lot of these different uh, debuffs. Um, for instance, if you go to, I believe it's banned communism, political violence is removed. Um, and then some of the other focuses will help you create a lot of exile, disjointed governments removed. Like, a lot of the different focuses will help you remove some of those debuffs. Luckily, as Germany, the worst thing we have is just some minus political power gain, which, honestly, our leader's going to negate for us. Um, so those are your national spirits. You have your faction. This is going to dismantle your faction. You can't only dismantle if it's just yourself in a faction and if you're not at war. Um, different government types. Now... There are big differences in different government types. Uh, demo democracy is the most passive. It's going to be easier to guarantee nations, but it's going to be harder to justify. Communism, it's easier to justify. Fascist, it's the easiest to justify and the quickest. And not aligned is a good middle ground between democracy and fascism where it's... You're not going to be able to justify as easily as communism, but you're not going to be justify a little bit easier than democratic as most democracies cannot just straight justify in other nations. Um... Here you will see occupied territories, collaborations, and managed subjects. Um, let me just tag um, England here because Germany does not have any puppets. 
So if I tag England, so as you can see, occupied territories. This is where level resistance comes into play a lot. It's your territory management. Um, you will see here that you have your resistance and your compliance. Your resistance is going to be country, um, a country that you're controlling that does not want to be part of your nation and will cause you to have debuffs. Um, it will cause you to damage buildings, lose population, lose, da you know, your garrisons will be damaged or lose manpower. If you get to a high enough level or go above 90, there'll be an open rebellion. The country will free itself and declare war on you. So let's say if all of a sudden Jamaica started to rise up and this number here started getting higher and higher, if it got past 90, there'd be a, a chance it could rebel and declare itself an independent nation and declare war on me. Um, luckily though, most of Britain's, I think almost all of Britain's, um, uh, colonies are very well controlled states these do not uh, involve your colonies per se um are very uh compliant as you move through different compliances you will gain more and more buffs so at the very beginning informants you'll have you'll be able to detect enemy operatives in that area easier um then when you get 25 your less garrison is required you get more population from them you'll get extra local resources and factories you get more recruitable population, and then a new regime, you can actually literally create a puppet version of that government where you don't control it, but they're their own government that is loyal to you, that is a puppet. Um, the way you change these is through your territory management. Um, very two important things up here. Um, oh, you can also switch between resistance on map and compliance on map. So this will show us compliance, very compliant nations here, zero resistance. Um, up here is very important. This chooses what garrison template you want to use. So this is our colonial garrison template, and you can see the production cost and what you need. It's going to be bad to use something like tanks. We're going to need a lot of tanks in order to do that. However, um, the suppression of them is also pretty bad because infantry was better at suppression than the tanks. Each um, division in a re regiment, or sorry, each um, regiment in a division, rather, it gives different suppression bonuses based on the type it is. It's a little in-depth, but basically you want it to be something simple. A 10 width, for instance, would be great. Um, if we go to our colonial garrison, I like to change the type just so they won't look the same. You put them on low reserves, and you want to get them to 10 width, so you remove that so they're 10 width. Um, we don't have the army XP to do that right now. I'll go over division templates at a later date, but let's just stick on this occupied territories. So next to that is this, and this is the law. This is default law, so this will apply to all your nations. If you want to do it for a specific nation, you click on theirs. This right here is going to show the different levels that you can use. Each have their own advantages or disadvantages in three separate areas. Resistance, control, compliance, and manpower. So the no garrison is going to give you a massive resistance to targets. So there's going to be more resistance in targets. Your um, compliance is not going to gain or lessen. And you will, but you will get a large percentage, 100% of the garrisons are not needed. So no garrisons are needed. Um, there's 60% of the required garrison, 65% all the way up to this, which is it requires a full garrison, so a full amount of garrison for the area. While forced labors and harsh quotas are going to require an above average amount of garrison, so even more garrisons than normal will be required. Um, as you can see, you can see that a lot of them are good at reducing resistance. If you get resistance in a lot of territories, I like to go with local police force or secret police. It's not he too heavy-handed. Local police is nice. Secret police, it really jumps up in that manpower, so it can really harm you. But it gets rid of that um, resistance really well. The only issue is it's going to reduce a lot of that compliance. It's really good to build compliance if you can, but local autonomy is not going to get rid of any of that um, resistance, and it can cause resistance to climb to levels in which you are very close to being um, like a rebellion happening, which is not good at all. Um... So again, choose these wisely, choose them well, make sure you're always looking at your resistance. Another way to lower resistance we'll talk about is with your intelligence agency, which I like to do a lot because it's a really good way to passively use your spies since their stacking is um, nerfed heavily. Um, so exiled governments, if a nation could choose, like say France, we can use their exiled governments in different ways. Um, basically, we can help give them autonomy and value in ways that helps their division do a bit more. You can get exiled generals, exiled, exiled generals, exiled... Um, Pilots, eight like aces, um, it's not that important. Subjects, um, you can see here different managing your subjects, the puppets that you own. So let's say I wanted to annex British Malay. So you can see if you resource map mode, you can see that there's a lot of resource in British Malay. If I wanted to annex them, 
it requires me to have 300 political power because it needs three more or 297 more than the three I have, which is 300. And it requires 500 um, of these little, I don't know what those are really called. I guess puppet points we'll call them, I guess. So to do that, we would need to start a lend lease. And the easiest way to do this is actually through convoys. If you want to annex a country, you build a ton of convoys. Now we need 500. 500 usually is around like 740-ish. So if you do it once, it's a big lump sum, yeah. So we could do that right now. We'd be really low on convoys. I never recommend going below 500 convoys, um, but we could lower it and then save up three in political power and automatically just annex British Malay off the bat. It's usually better to wait for the political power then send them the convoys, then just hold that 300 political power until it gets sent. It takes about a month. Once that gets sent, then you can annex them. Um, <clears throat> that's taking me as subject. You can see what level they're at. Like these co these colonies, um, if they gain more autonomy, they're going to become free. Um, New Zealand, Canada, Australia. Raj is a step away. They're a colony, not a dominion. Like the rest of these are dominions. And the British Malaya is integrated puppet. Um, so that's where you can manage a lot of those areas. All right, moving forward. Laws and government, research, production, military staff. So your first three laws and government are always going to be here. It's your level of conscription. Basically, the recruitable population percentage takes your overall manpower and takes a percentage of that and allows you to have that as manpower. So this is, we are on 1.5%. One, uh, so we take 1.5% of our core population, basically states we have cored. So these are all core states. Click a state, go over to the left. You can see it's a core state. Um, you're going to get all the manpower from that. So the recruitable population here in this region um, versus the civilian population. So 3.65 million people live here, but the recruitable population from that is only um, 30, 45 to 36.93 thousand. And the reason that is is because the total population includes um, people who are not fit for service, the elderly, the young, um, in this day and age, women um, would not be allowed to serve as well. So only the recruitable population from here is only 36, about approximately like 37,000. Uh, um, the volunteer only that we have only allows us to take 1.5% of that from this region. And that is for all the regions, particularly our overall manpower. We also have another debuff as it says down there, the war to end all wars in that middle section, which is one of our national spirits, which reduces the recruitable population factor, which is the population we get from um, the step from civilian to recruitable. So that doesn't affect our recruitable percentage. These are two different modifiers. The recruitable population is the amount we get from the overall manpower. Um, I see the recruitable population factor. But um, so this is the base percentage. This is a factor of the percentage. So this just lessens our overall percentage by 30%, which is not good. That is a huge debuff. That's cutting our manpower in a third, objectively. Um, so increasing to volunteer only, I usually like to state an extensive conscription. The training time is not that bad of a debuff. It's 10% extra of the time. Um, if it takes 100 days to train a unit, it's going to take 110. You can deploy it early if you really need to with a little bit less of the experience, but sometimes that it can be quite um, non or can be quite difficult for units uh, experience. Um, if you go any higher than that, like these are all kind of, these are decent to be on. Don't be on disarm nation. That's bad. Limited is pretty good. Extensive is the best. Search by crime and all adult servants scraping the barrel are going to give you massive debuffs to your um, industry. Your construction speed, your output, your um, factories and dockyards, and your training time is going to increase heavily. Um, so I would say just stay on extensive if you can. Um, it's easier to do this if you're fascist or communist and at war. If not, then there's a lot of hoops and lads you gotta jump through with democracies in order to be have extensive scription, be a democracy. Um, your the enemy strength has to be fifty percent or more compared to our army. So. It's a lot easier to do this if you're fascist or communist. Generally, people like to do this in meme games. Okay. <clears throat> your trade focus. Your trade um, is important to your economy, especially early on. A lot of people like to go free trade because of that construction bonus. Again, this is pretty, pretty clear to see. Um, your construction speed, research speed, factory output, dockyard output will all be bonused. But you will leak intelligence a little bit easier than if you go limited or closed. Um, and you can only go closed if you are on war economy or total mob. 
and you cannot go close to the Soviet Union and have the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. So just keep that in mind. Also very harmful to a lot of nations that you can be friends with, and it will lose you a lot of factories because not no one's trading with you anymore. If you do this as America, no one's getting your oil. Bad. Um, but resources to market. So a lot of times when you're trading resources, you have some or some that you make yourself. So extracted, we have eight oil extracted, and we're exporting four. We don't get that. No matter if someone's buying it or not, it we don't. We don't touch it. It's it's basically just lost. Simply because we are on export focus and resources to market is 50%. Half of eight is four. That's the 50% that we're losing that we literally never touch. That is never, ever going, that we're never gonna get. That's just is going away because of our trade law. So that's what trade laws do. Um, again, you can see here, this is the export focus on either side. Um, economy, this is something you really wanna change early on because the key thing to work on early is industry. Um, there are five different stages. Um, usually partial mob is really easy to get to. If you have more than 25% war support, you're going to be able to get to it, um, no matter what ideology you are. But if you're war economy, you can get it if you're over 50%, if you're fascist or communist. Uh, total mob, you have to be at war no matter who you are. Um, and you, the enemy has to have a, a substantially more. Um, there is a catch with total mob. Um, we'll get to that in a second. But consumer... Civilian economy and early mob are debuffs to construction speed. As you can see, negative 30% construction speed to both types of factories. Not good. Early mob, only 10%. Um, also, you're getting less fuel per oil. You also have less fuel capacity and your conversion rate, which I don't really convert factories that often, but is much lower. You use a conversion rate here and you get a little bit more fuel per oil. When you go to partial mob, the only debuff you have here is the fuel per oil. And you get actually a bonus to only mill construction and also to the conversion cost. But the biggest thing here is those consumer goods. I'll cover that real quickly in construction. Consumer goods is a certain percentage of your uh, civilian factories that is always being set aside. Kind of like the four oil we talked about earlier. The people, they need their McDonald's. They need their, their I don't know what, their crumpets whatever they need their civilian factories in order to make the consumer goods of the nation in our case we have 31 percent because we're on civilian economy but we get three percent of that reduced because we have positive stability which again i'll go over in a minute um so we want to lower our consumer goods so most of our civilian factories are then producing things because right now if we wanted to build mills you can only build 15 factories are working on this one mill while two are working on these three mills They'll build one at a time, but at the same time, we're only getting 17 <laughs> factories usage out of the 30 that we have, because 13 of them are getting used by consumer goods. And if we start trading for something, like we want to get some more oil from the United States, that's going to cost us a factory. So, civilian factories are very important. So, you want to keep that as low as possible. So, it's good to get to partial mob and then our economy. Um, the drawback to total mob is you will lose 3% of your recruitable population. Now, in many cases, when you go total mode, you can also do women, women in the workforce, which I don't think we can see right now because it's not actually because we're not at war, but it costs, I believe, 100 to 150 political power. So if you save up like 250 political power, you can switch to total mode and get women in the workforce, and women in the workforce reduces your stability minimally, but gives you 3%. Um, recruitable population which counteracts the debuff of this and allows you to basically just lose um, 10 consumer goods which is phenomenal okay <clears throat> yeah it's, it's, get your popcorn get your notes this is gonna be a long video political advisors this is um, where a lot of your country is gonna be like decided on where it's going um, you have different people that perform different jobs usually you're gonna have three types of people that do the same job, maybe four, is the communist, democratic, and fascist revolutionaries. If you go pick one of these, you're basically trying to switch your ideology. If you want to be fascist, you want to switch your ideology to fascism, you go fascist demagogue. If you want to go communist, you would get a communist revolutionary. There's going to be basically a pop-up that happens on here that says um, fascism on the rise, communism on the rise, um, that will basically give you the ability to switch your government over to a different ideology when you reach over 50%. Um, in Britain's case, I don't believe that's the case because they have a focus tree and designed for that. And these these are locked by focus. Um, you need to, your party to be communist or fascist before these two men are elected. 
um, in a country that wouldn't have that restriction. I think Iraq, no, Iraq wouldn't. So let's tag Iraq. Um, so Iraq, I think it's Iraq is Iraq, yes. So we tag Iraq. This is this is the default focus drain, Windows 56. Actually, I think it's the default, or the default in the game too, I believe. Oh, I'm not. I don't have Red 56 on. I'm stupid. <laughs> uh, they're so used to playing it, but this is the base focus tree. As you can see, um, they've a communist, a democrat, and a, a democrat, and a fascist revolutionary. Um, using any of these will slowly boost your nation towards that side, um, and will slowly allow your nation to become that uh, faction or that ideology, rather. Um, other people that you have, if we switch back to, um, England. So some of these other ones are pretty self-explanatory. Silent workhorses are always good to get early because they will give you, they will pay for themselves because they give you political power over time. Um, I don't usually go with backroom backstabbers. Ideology drift defense is not that important unless you're getting really influenced by the nations. War industrials are very good. Um, bonuses to construction of factories is very popular and, and for an obvious reason it's very good you also have a, a civilian economist who can do the same thing but for infrastructure refineries and civilian econ and civilian factories which is better to get early because usually you start the game building civs and then turn this into mills later uh, armament organizer um, civilian to military factory cost that's conversion I don't really do that much quartermaster generals are good at building situational again that's as you can see building bases radar stations rocket sites nuclear reactors good in certain situations um some of those are specific to britain um non-core manpower um if i may show you something i love to do with japan when playing comp games is non-core manpower is very nice if you're taking areas with massive amounts of manpower japan goes after countries with huge amounts of manpower go to population as you can see red means there's a lot like 53 million 25 million 34 million 38 million if you get into india 31 million 33 million 36 million 18 million seven like just massive amounts of people and you can't really core it in comp games as you can in meme games so they have a prince of terror which gives you a plus two percent to your non-core manpower um, as you can see here, this is a state you don't own. As you can move over to the state, well, don't, don't core, sorry, it's occupied. So you get negative 65% of the resources, only, you get 25% of the factories, you lose 75% of them, um, and you can only use 50% of the building slots, less max factories in the state, as it shows here. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to manpower, uh, so here it is, so... Non-core state, you lose 98%. Local compliance, you gain a bit, as you can see down there. Um, it's a non-core state, so that 97, 97.110 is the debuff you're getting to it. The um, Prince of Terror is going to give you extra non-core manpower, which may seem, not seem like a lot because it's 2%. However, 2% of the recruitable population you're going to get from a 38 million state an 18 million, a 34 million, so on, so on, so on, and so forth, is going to act quickly, and you can make leaps and bounds in manpower. Again, Japan doesn't really struggle a ton on manpower till later in the game, but especially if you're taking, if you end up doing well with Japan, and like you're stopped at the Raj, and you're grinding it out, you're gonna need a lot of manpower, and that's gonna really help in China. Um, so political advisors, compassionate gentlemen are really bad. Um, elusive gentlemen, they basically give you an extra operative, which can be good depending on what you're doing. I can talk about collaboration governments and stuff like that when we get to operatives. Um, but they're, again, situational. But again, silent workhorses, war industrialists are your go-to. Prince of Terrors are very good. Um, obviously, you want to change your government type. You're going to need these revolutionaries or reformers. Um, but that's really what your political advisor comes down to. Research and production. <clears throat> you have a couple different areas. Tanks, ships, planes... Um, then you have either infantry, motorized, or artillery, and you have an industrial concern and a theorist. Let's go to some with a little bit more options. 
we just say we've had some quite a few. So good old the US of A, very nice. Um, so when we go to material designers, you can see you can do infantry, motorized, artillery. Um, some of those are rockets here, but usually the one of the three comes down to basically your research, boost your research. Some uh, will have other bonuses. I believe in some mods, like some, there will be multiple infantry designers. One will give you extra soft attack. One will give you like a lower production cost of infantry equipment. Um, basically, just read the buffs that are not too difficult to understand. But these are just research speed and base game is really what it is. Um, what it comes down to is more complex ones are the aircraft, ship designer, and tank designer. Um, industrial concerns, American America's ones are pretty easy. Electronics research speed, a lot of people get this confused. This is engineering, this is electronics. I don't believe electronics and that buff comes into effect here. This is atomic and experimental. So if you were as America to take the electronical engineering, GE, you would only get the buffs for this part of the tree here, not here. This is atomic and experimental lines. Um, the refining concern that's industrial, that will apply to all of the area in industry here. I believe it also applies to excavation. I do not believe that the industry will also apply to the synthetics because sometimes there are synthetic bonuses here. Um, you can sometimes get synthetic bonuses, like Germany gets a synthetic uh, bonus, industrial concern. Um, I like General Motors, if you can get it, it gives you the same amount. Um, oh, see this one actually gives you 5% industrial and 50% synthetic, so double dip in there. This one gives you 15% industrial, but an extra factory output. It's like that, but you have to do the focus wartime industry, which is like all the way down here. And, uh, yeah, but yeah, whatever. Um, theorists, before we go into the three big ones. Um, basically... Your nation has kind of like Horford's like, oh, this is what you, the USA actually did. Why don't you try that out? If not, then I guess you, you know, you can do the normal one. USA doesn't have a normal one um, when it comes to, I guess, um, what I should have said is when it, let me start over. Um, the game has a certain way as far as doctrine that it kind of wants you to play because that's what the nation did in World War II. Um, for instance, America's like, oh, superior, superior firepower, which was basically the strategy America took during the war and they're like oh let's give you a superior superior firepower expert so this will give you a bonus only to the uh, superior firepower it's a tongue twister for me i don't know why um doctrine patent will give you a mobile warfare bonus and only mobile warfare um this but then if you have just a regular theorist so like this naval theorist who will give you bonuses to all naval doctrine um while a naval aviation planner will only give you bonuses to base strike doctrine an air warfare will give you all air doctrine, 10%, but the victory through air power will only give strategic destruction, which is a 15%. So what you want to focus on in a lot of these situations is what you're doing and prioritize that direction. If you're going one of these two, it's great to get them because this is a 15, or I'll go to one of this. This is a base one that's 10% extra air doctrine research speed. That's 15. So you get an extra 5% for kind of playing into the game's hands a bit. Using a lot of situations, you'll get a rocket and a nuclear scientist. That'll give you 50% research speed to either rockets or atomic research. Um, let's see here. Now we're going to move over to these three big ones. So tank designers. Um, usually you will have three types of tank designers. Light, medium, and heavy. Um, mobile tank designers or light designers will use even more max speed. Um, an extra liability and again that armor research speed medium tank designers will give you extra soft attack and that research speed heavy tank designers will give you more armor and more research speed armor is the most important when you get in the battle and there's combat you have tanks if your tanks or divisions have armor it's harder to pierce them and their stats will be buffed because they are not being able they're not they're not able to be pierced so if your division has armor your division is not going to be pierced as easily unless someone has heart attack. If you don't have heart attack, you can't pierce the division. Their division is going to be really good. Armor is always necessary. If you can, if you can't get pierced, you're not really going to lose as easily. So I usually choose heavy tank designers. It's again 15% armor research speed, 50%, 15%. All you're gaining is the difference in armor and heart attack. Yeah, this is great because you get extra armor and extra, you know, counter to their armor, more heart attack because armor, armor, is countered by heart attack, which. I will get into 
Then we go over division templates. When we go to ship designers, you will have a couple. There's a couple um, options. Usually everyone will have an Atlantic or Pacific if they're a naval nation. There's also coastal and raiding. So Atlantic is going to make your carriers and capital ships hit harder. Old school naval doctrine. Think big ships, dreadnoughts, battleships, cruisers, you know, big guns. Pacific is going to be more carrier oriented. So carriers are going to have less armor, but their deck size is going to increase. More fighter planes, which is really helpful for this more modern age in naval warfare, which World War II kind of brought along. Um, again, also max range. Your ships are going to be able to go further. Raiding is basically going to give your ships more speed to get in and out of quick combats, keep them alive for longer, um, but also nerf a carrier deck size and capital ship heavy attack, so it's more of a smaller hit-and-run type of navy. Coastal is entirely made for, like, coastal defense um, and trying to spam as much ships as possible. So your carrier production is going to decrease, your capital ship production is going to decrease, same with your screens, submarines, screens, or cruisers, and destroyers. <clears throat> but your deck size and max range is going to be lowered for carriers, your max range for everything is going to be lowered, so it's going to be kept closer to your shores, really defensive, really focused on just, just shitting out ships as quick as possible. Um, when it comes to planes, usually you want to go light aircraft. Um, air is the most important thing in Hoi 4. Flat out, period. No questions asked. Well, maybe industry, but like it's an iffy one because use industry to build the planes, but whatever. Light aircraft designers are good because they affect your fighter agility. If you have higher agility in a combat, in an air combat, you will be you will have a better chance of winning that air zone, and your fighters will do more damage to enemy fighters because you have higher agility. One of the reasons Japan is so good is because the agility for Japan in Mitsubishi is I believe it's 15% compared to the normal 10% you get from the rest of the light air designers, which is really good. So you get more max speed and more agility, helps your planes to be better, your fighters and carrier fighters. Medium aircraft designer will be focused on heavy fighters, tactical bombers, and scout planes, and focus on their reliability. Not that good. CAS, you could go with this one if you really want to focus and you know you're winning the air war and your CAS is, what your CAS is really good. Um, you need to make sure your ground attack um, is, is really going to hike up. The more ground attack you have, the easier it's going to be pushed when you have cast in certain areas. Um, heavy aircraft designers only good for strategic bombers. Strategic bombing's useful, but you need a lot of strategic bombers, and they cost a lot. Um, <clears throat> naval aircraft bombers, or aircraft designer, is good for naval bombers, carrier naval bombers, and carrier fighters and cast, which is not bad. Um, this helps your carrier fighters have extra range and agility, which... It's pretty good, but at the same time, unless you're using your carrier fighters when you're fighting the rest of the regular fighters, it's not going to be that beneficial. Um, so that covers reaches and production. Military staff, these people will help improve your army. These will help improve your navy. These will help improve your air force. While your military high command, these will be a combination of three. Usually, these three are affecting army. So infantry, commando, and army logistics, strategic bombing, close air support, tactical bombing. Those are air, naval, at, um, amphibious assault, and carriers. Those are all going to be Navy. You can get any of these three um, and put them in here. You can also get rid of something by right-clicking it and move it for, I think, a cost of like 10. <clears throat> um, I usually like uh, Army Speed or Offense here or Defense. I'm of a defensive nation. Um, division Training Time is also good, especially like Japan that has to pump out a ton of divisions really quickly. Um, for Navy... Usually naval aviation is really good for using carriers, especially Halsey. This is this bonus is disgusting. Um, air, for being an air con, you really want to um, make sure you get uh, a ground, or like an air superiority or a ground. Uh, well, what's the name? I think. Um, I can't remember. What's the, I can't remember the name, but I, I think Hungary has one. Um, ground support, yeah. It gives you extra air superiority. That's really good to use, because Hungary usually goes air superiority, or air con in comp games, so that's helpful. Um, ace, ace generation's all right, not the best. Um, but not too bad. Um, and then when you go military high command, it's just whatever you can get. Armor's nice. Um, their vision recovery is always good. Don't be so turned off by cav a lot of people use cav as um, 
garrison divisions. So this will help out with your garrison defense, and also this helps with your motorized and mechanized. So in those tank divisions, which we'll talk about later, those are going to be very beneficial to help out with those. <clears throat> um, yep. So that right there, that covers your entire political area here. Your focus tree, something you want to talk about when you go to focus trees is um, what to prioritize first. Um, in comp games, usually you have a path you have to go down that's to based on what your country needs to focus on. For instance, Hungary, you usually rush to get the indigenous designs. Um, <clears throat> their different air experience and their light fighter effort so they can rush fighters as quick as possible um, because they're air con. Um, but if you're doing like a meme game, something you really want to focus on is building your industry as best you can. And then from there, moving on into switching your government up. So if I were playing Hungary, um, in, the, in a meme game, I would want to make sure I take Austria first. So I would want to say I'm going Austria-Hungary. I would try to restore Austria-Hungary. So go down this path here, ban the referendum and take Austria-Hungary. I get it. I'm pretty set there. I can kind of wait a while because Germany's not going to do Beta Czechoslovakia for a minute. So then I can focus on doing some of my um, industrial focuses to really ramp up my industry to make sure I'm trying to make sure to trying to produce as much as I can as quick as I can. The quicker you get into industry and you focus on that civilian industry, the more military industry you're going to be able to build up later. Also, you want to prioritize focuses that are going to get you more in the long run. Just like a silent workhorse, if you get it early, it's going to pay for itself and then give you dividends after. If you get a research slot, you want to kind of make sure you rush those because they're going to get you, they're going to pay off the earlier you have them. The earlier you have a research slot, the earlier you're going to be able to start researching with it and going even further down into your tech tree, the more you're going to be able to unlock. So I think a lot of people like do a bunch of stuff and stop at the research slot. No, get that research slot, focus that research slot and use it because those are some of the most valuable resources you can get as the game in the game is to get more research and capacity going down more um, areas of research and focusing on different sections of your research in order to better your army navy air force and doctrines too a lot of people don't do doctrines and meme games and i think that's something that really shows up when they try to take on a stronger nation or a player nation is that their that doctrine isn't there and it really shows in the combat Okay, moving on from the political tab, we're going to go ahead and just take a look at these different tabs as we go on, um, all the way from decisions down to logistics. Some of them are going to take more time, some are going to take less, but again, I wanted to make sure this was in very in-depth and a very um, holistic cover of Hoi 4, um, just to make sure that I cover every single base, um, again, except... Um, naval because I um, I don't want to say things that are wrong or incorrect or don't fully tell everything because again I do not know the full extent of that I will work on talking with some of the other guys that I know in both this community and others that are very good at naval and I will help um, to either get a script written or have one of them maybe be featured on the video for naval because that is a whole other entity but without further ado let's go back in to the decisions um, this is kind of special because Germany has some special decisions, but in all actuality, many of your decisions are going to be very basic and very simplistic um, to start the game out. Um, in a lot of situations, um, they're good for stability and other minor improvements. Again, we talked about if you are to go with the total mobilization, you also have the ability to do women in the workforce, counteracting that 3% negative recruitable population with a positive 3% going flat, and it'll help you out. Um, it's important to note with Germany now that uh, one of the updates got rid of the MIFO bills um, payment button. So it always pays them. It just gets more and more expensive as time goes on. Just don't click the cancel button because it will just 20% consumer goods and it will just shit on your economy. Um, Institute press censorship is nice um, for some countries in order to boost your amount of um, political ideology. Um, in a lot of situations, it is good to get somebody who is a um, ideology booster, even if you're already the ideology you want to be, just because the more support you have for your party, the more stability you'll, you'll get. And we'll talk over stability in a second. Basically, the more popular your party is, the more stable your country is. Um, and at the max stability, you will get a negative 5% reduction in consumer goods, which is good. 
Um, there are many other decisions, war propaganda. It's really good to get war support, especially for democratic countries. So it's really good to aim for those. Um, a lot of people, I don't see a lot of people taking these. The ban and ban democracy and communism and the anti-democratic raids. So the banning is rough because it does get rid of a percentage of stability based on the percentage of democracy you have or communism if you're doing banned communism. But if we look at the numbers here and we look at anti-democratic raids, it says you lose 10% stability, but over a weekly period, you get a 0 0.70 stability over 120 days. So if we were to take 120 days and we're divided by seven, you're going to get 17.14 weeks. And if you multiply that by 0.7, it's going to give you 12% stability. So you're gaining 2% stability. You're just taking that initial hit and you are then investing in it and it will get you an extra 2% stability in the late run. Um, while it's doing that, it's also going to get rid of some of the democracy support. And because this is a pie chart, all the numbers have to equal up to 100, a reduction in democracy will equal a increase in other political parties, whether that is, in this case, the KDP or the NSDAP. Um, usually if something is zero, it won't get bonuses to it from these tabs. Um, and I believe if you ban communism or even democratic parties through this political action in the base game, you can still get communist revolutionaries or um, democratic revolutionaries. Um, I don't know. I don't know why I would do that, but I, don't, I think it's a possibility if you like misclick. Um, promises of peace. Um, are good for just stability, but it will, it will reduce your war support. So you want to be careful with that. Um, yeah, that's basically the basic decisions. Um, if we're to look at some other nations, some a little bit more interesting stabil um, stability, or sorry, decisions. The Americans have the Congress, which only America has. I don't really know why um, some other countries don't have this, like the parliamentary system in Britain, but whatever. Um, basically, through this, you're able to do lobbying efforts, which will give you a negative political power gain, but will give you more support in the Senate and the House of Representatives, which will allow you to do some things that require those senators. Um, so you need, it's like this one. This right here is in usually the historical way that you would get rid of the Depression. Um, these three focuses, agricultural adjustment, fair labor, and federal housing. Um, and to do so, you need 49 senators and 128 representatives. And you are literally, um, request support of 49 senators. You have one senator off and you have the exact number of representatives. After you do this, eight senators and four representatives will go into opposition. So you're constantly battling this balance of power in America in order to do what you need to do. Unless, of course, you just, like, circumvent it and go communist or fascist even authoritarians in here it's weird but new america tree's weird um yeah so we go back to this this is a really good these are really good um i don't know why more people in the allies don't take this but for a negative 10 percent stability buff or debuff you get one you get 10 percent faster research it's phenomenal um i would highly recommend taking this um america's a little bit difficult because your political power gain is at um throughout most of the game um also prospect for resources is really nice these require you to have certain excavation technologies but nevertheless they are good for when you're running low on resources um america usually does kind of run low on some aluminum and tungsten every now and then um but you know other than that it's pretty good um as far as yeah, improved worker improved worker conditions is always nice because it gives you um basically no permanent negative debuffs for a limited amount of time, you have an extra 5% consumer goods, which your stability will offset if you're at 100%, and a negative 10% factory output. Basically, your factories are less efficient. They're producing less. Um, and for that time, you are getting weekly stability plus 0.5 for a total of 180 days. So you're gaining permanent positive benefits while suffering non-permanent negative debuffs. Um, the naval treaties... If you withdraw from these too early, basically, countries can declare war on you, including Britain, France, and Italy. Um, Japan is also in this. That's the one others. Um, yeah. As far as special decisions, France has devaluated the franc, which is really nice um, for their massive amounts of debuffs they have to get rid of it. Um, 
other de the other decisions are very self-explanatory. This is not something I think I need to delve too deep into, but they're very self-explanatory. Again, just always check your decisions tab. Look at some things, crunch the numbers here and there with these because a lot of them are very beneficial. Moving on from that, we're gonna go into intelligence agencies. Now, intelligence agencies are very beneficial for certain reasons. Let me move over to Germany again. So, intelligence agencies. Um, just go ahead and create one for 30 days. So I'll give you some backstory while this is going on. But basically, intelligence agencies are going to allow you to do a lot of different um, uh, possibilities and concepts. And it's also even based on what nation you are. Based on what nation you are and what ideology you are, it allows you to do different things, a complete different goals, um, and uh, can even help you capitulate nations easier, which is a huge benefit for the Axis. Um, I remember Germany and Japan in comp games... Um, are very wise to use this buff against some of their enemies, especially for Germany, um, the Soviets. Um, also, if a France wants to hold, um, a lot of times, I think I've seen a couple of times where people can get a full um, collaboration government in France and they pair drop Brest, Bordeaux, and um, Paris, and then they just, they, they France capitulates. Um, so, in here, again, if you want to. Um, you can click to change the name and title of it if you want to. Um, Spy Master, if you are a... Um, you have, obviously, three different branch upgrades that need to be in a faction. And the more people that are in your faction, you'll get more spies. So, when it comes to these upgrades, a couple of them do a couple different things. Um, this is all cryptology, which if you can decrypt a nation's um, bonus... Or decrypt a nation, you get a bonus against it. Um, basically, breakthrough, naval invasion speed air coverage basically just makes you your attacks and your offense against them tremendously better um these will all help you get better um buffs for your uh encryption your cryptology so basically make it faster and stronger and this will give you defense cryptology against being decrypt or against being decrypted um operative training so this basically helps your operat operatives be better. Localized training centers is nice. And the reason this is, is because if you get a localized training center, you can recruit somebody from a certain part of the world. So usually what I would do first to Germany is get this. And then I would get a person from France. And then put them in France to create a spy network. Now let's go ahead and get a operative. So let's just do this right there. So I'll do that. And I would get a operative from France. The reason I would get an operative from France is because when I do a... Um, training center or when I do a spy mission in France it's going to have a, be a greater benefit and it's going to um, get to 100% or 50% quicker because that person is native to France um, the command of trade is really nice if you want to do a lot of secret um, operations um, stealing bl blueprints blowing up civilian factories interrogation is really good because if you capture an operative you get more out of it um, diplomatic and psychological warfare are only good if you really want to influence a nation in a CIA, Central America type way, which isn't really good for a lot of different, um, isn't good for a lot of different, uh, like competitive games. So we got that. Let's go ahead and we click this button. We're going to get the guy immediately. And if I click this and I mouse over him, so the base is 0.4, but he gets an extra 30% because it's from its local nationality. Because if I click this guy... Um, where do I see his? I don't think you can see his traits unless you pick a new one, which is kind of sad. But he is French in origin. So that's going to give us a bonus there. And we've already researched that. Again, these take civilian factories to do, so make sure you're not crippling your economy if it's not necessary. Um, blueprint stealing will help you steal blueprints. They will give you a research bonus. Or they will actually will give you the ability to have a research of an enemy nation, so you can steal research from enemies. Um, coordinated strike is good for like initial quick assault on a nation. They're they're interesting and they immediately make you declare war. It's a weird mechanic. Um, this helps blueprint stealing. Plastic explosives help with exploding enemy factories and suicide pills keep your people from getting captured as often. I really like these two. Acid defense basically better counterintelligence and anti-partisan is brute resistance. So basically, that's another way to stop resistance. Um, with your spies, which I'll go into like the spy tab in a second. I just want to finish up with these. Um, and then these intelligences are going to give you different levels of intelligence for each department. Um, economy, Army, Naval, and Air. So you basically see that through your intel ledger here. 
you can mouse through all these different sections. First, you have your industry, army, navy, and air force. So your industry, this gives you a lot of information. You can see aluminum they're producing and also exporting and also importing um, throughout. And you can see, you know, aluminum, oil, uh, rubber, tungsten, steel, chromium. You can see the amount of factories they have, the manpower, available fuel, and convoys. And because you don't have a high amount of in, um, intelligence, it could be the lowest, the highest, or somewhere in between of any of these numbers. You can see the factories they've used in trade, the number of sieves they have, and there's damage to a certain percentage of their sieves or mills, mills they've had, their dockyards, and what they're putting their mills on. So right now they have four to six on infantry equipment, um, one on tanks and two on planes, and then you'll see they have two on dockyards, or two dockyards on convoys or subs, and then some on some screen ships and cruisers, and then they have not on capital ships. You also look here at their growth for damaged industry and total industry, produced and lost convoys, and produced and lost bombers. So there's, there's not enough intel to access these in over a certain amount of time. Also down here, this is very important, you can see their civilian economy, their level of um, trade, and also their level of conscription, which is very nice to look at. This right here is something that not a lot of people utilize and is their research. If you get a high enough intel on somebody, you can see what they've researched. This for industry is not as important, but it is very important when it comes down to, you can see what kind of tanks they've researched, what kind of infantry equipment, what kind of supply, and also the doctrine, which is very important, which we will get into later. Um, here again, you can see the number of divisions, their total special forces, their manpower, and their army stockpile, their navy and what it's comprised of, and their air force. You need to know this is the amount of manpower in the navy and the amount of man manpower in the air force. This is not the total number of planes. I remember in the comp game getting really scared because somebody said Britain had 100,000 planes when they actually all had 100,000 people in the air force. Big difference. Again, you can also see their air in, um, the, if you get enough intel, you can see their air research and their air doctrine research as well as naval. Um, so going back to this, we covered all the bases here. Um, you can see different operations you can attribute here. Um, and again, this is a little stats you can see. Current operatives, operatives captured by the enemy and operatives, operatives killed by the enemy. This is where you can conduct cryptology if we were to research the first cryptology. And this is where you get the business done. Ah, there it is. So as you can see here, because we recruited this guy from France, he has French nationality, giving the bonuses that you can see here. Um, strength in gaining intel in certain areas that are French. Um, better operation effectiveness and less operation cost, which is nice because operations cost um, either support equipment, civilian factories, infantry equipment. There's a lot of stuff it can cost. Um, they also have buffs, so that will give them buffs or debuffs and escape artist is nice because they have um, the ability to help get other operatives out and they don't usually get captured as often themselves and spies can upgrade like generals which again we'll talk about generals later um then there's the multiple different um options that they can pursue counterintelligence is basically only using your nation or allied nations that you have um allowing you to perform counterintelligence make it harder for enemy spies to do their work um, there are two types of intel networks. Build an intel network will in increase the amount of intel. So it will slowly go up 1%, 2%. While quiet intel will keep the amount of intel, but will not create it any higher. Boosting an ideology will slowly boost um, your said ideology or an ideology of your choice, if you have that ability, in a certain nation. You have to, for these next few... Um, I believe you have to have an intel network to do so. And propaganda will lower the amount of stability and war support in a nation. Free out resistance is for your own territory and needs to be placed on an area where there is resistance. We have none, so we're good. Control trade is basically an area for a spot where um, we use against only AI because that's really only who it affects. And we'll try to force the AI to have a higher trade opinion, thus making them want to trade with you more. Diplomatic pressure, um, kind of, it's 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 weird. Um, it makes the nation be more pacifist toward you, making them want to them a non-aggression more often, and will kind of lower the world tension. It's weird. Um, again, these two I've never used to be quite honest. Most times I use spies as in comp games, and for then you just use build intel network and quiet intel network, and if you just wanted 
try to like chip away at somebody as best you can. You use these two um, propaganda and uh, boosting, boosting ideology and root out resistance. I love this. This is the best thing about spies, I think, is that they're able to root out resistance so easily. Um, but the biggest thing you want to do is, especially as Germany, is create um, a collaboration government. And I think we should be able to see that. Once we get to 50%, we should be able to see that, which will take time. Um, but it'll basically come up here, you have to assign two operatives to it, and then from there, you are able to continually do it. Now, cool thing with Germany is, is they also have this guy, the elusive gentleman, which gives you an extra operative slot and negative 15% agency upgrade time. So I usually would take him, that would give me another operative, and what I would do is, is I would get two operatives because I would get one more. If you do, I believe, five of these upgrades, you get another operative. So one operative base, one more operative from five, and one operative from the um, elusive gentleman, and then you have three operatives. You keep the French operative in here, then you take the different, um, take the different, the other two operatives, and you use them to complete the collaboration government, and you can slowly build up a collaboration government, and usually you can get it to its max level which will reduce the enemy's um, surrender rate by 20%. So you only have to capitulate them 80% of the way, and the collaboration government will do the other 20%, and they capitulate it. Which for France is quite easy because of their victors of the Great War, which is right, where is victors of the Great? Right, no, there. Um, war support minus five. Uh, oh, no, it's actually just trying to cover my bad. Um, they have a negative 50% surrender limit. So for France, it's really not necessary for the surrender limit. However, when you create a collaboration government, there will be less resistance in a target. And if there's less resistance, there's less factories that can get damaged, less garrisons need to be sent there. They can even become their own nation if you want to. Um, so it's really beneficial in that way to uh, help help you out in the long run so for this i'll take another escape artist because i just love that unless there was a counterintelligence operative which are really nice so if you look at operations yes prepare, prepare a collaboration here but this is what you want to do um i don't know if become a spy master this guy's good here to do this i kind of just want operative so let's just do let's do that As you can see you can also in, uh, infiltrate different administrations, both civilian, army, and navy. And this is how you will steal blueprints, or air force, and you will also steal blueprints. Orchestrating coups are very hard to do, and you have to have the certain. There has to be certain limitations for um, the coups, like a certain percentage of negative stability and a certain percentage of um, foreign support. Um, resistant contacts will help you sabotage industry infrastructure, resources, and strengthen the resistance in an area, making um, this resistance tab in your occupied territories a little bit more difficult to handle. So this is the point where he's at 50%. I would hold him at that number there, go back into this tab, and I would prepare the collaboration government, but I want to wait until I have another, let's do that. I need one, two, three, four, five. So once this is done, we should have the ability to get in the recruit in 30 days. And once that's done again, you keep him on the quiet Intel network and you keep rotating these um, two people through. Yep, we'll get another operative in 29 days. Let's just keep going on with this. And the Spanish Civil War. Uh, that's something I actually want to talk about because I'll talk about micro there a little bit. Um, so this is actually good timing. We can, I guess we can move on to micro from there and we'll take a break from this. So let's go ahead. Oh, uh, and sending volunteers, little side note. So we're going to send them to obviously National Spain. We send volunteers. You want to also send air volunteers with it. So we can send a limit of two. So let's look at our army right quick. And let's just select tanks. Let's just get all right. let's get all of our tanks. Let's just take this one and we'll switch it to a cavalry division so we'll get the tanks back. 
Oh, so in our stockpile. And let's not assign a general because they'll have to get over there anyway. So two divisions there. Bop, bop. Boom. Two divisions with air. So now that how to send air volunteers is you click an airport. So go ahead and just delete our air force right now because we don't really need them because they're in weird numbers. So if I click this, sometimes glitches out. Uh, 193. So we can set 193. So let's make, um, if, when putting planes over, if you control click, it's 100. If you shift click, it's 10. So for us, we kind of want some, it's 193. So let's do 100 fighters. Let's do 90. Three. Oh. Ah, just... Ninety-three close air support. Now put them on these because you want your. We'll go over air in the future, but we'll just have them on this um, for now. And then once they deploy, because you have to wait till they're done deploying. Standing by. Click here, and then the air zone you want them to activate in. And we should get green air, because the German fighters created the Spanish ones are pretty good. Um, oh, that's not good for them. All right. But anyway, can we recruit a new operative yet? 15 days, okay. Let's get a new operative and start that, and then we can move on to micro, I think a big area that people want to know about. The troops are already in Galicia, they're waiting there. Okay. that just for the video's sake and recruiting an operative recruit a new one just get old Scarface collaboration government so then you pick everyone but the French um, person and then this is a really cool feature commence when ready and automatically repeat and it will stop once you reach the maximum collaboration and you just prepare and again it is going to take 200 units of support equipment 2,000 units of infantry equipment and 11 factories over 60 days and that's for civilian factories so again these are these are costly and they're not cheap to do but they have a huge payoff for france for the reduction in resistance same with poland and for russia the reduction in surrender at um, level because in a comp game it's gonna be really hard to take vladivostok which usually becomes the russian capital if they lose the big three cities of stalingrad moscow <laughs> excuse me and leningrad all right moving on to so just some few combat tips with um, micro. So for this, let's assign somebody who's good with tanks. That would be Heinz Guderian. And we can upgrade him with Panzer Expert. We'll go over more of the army stuff later. But what you want to do is when you want a micro, you want to create encirclements. If a unit's encircled, it's not going to get any enforcements. It's not going to get any supply. It's going to have negative debuffs. It's on one tile, and it's going to die when you um, break it rather than just running away. So this is a nice little encirclement here. They have no supply. The way supply works is is that a nation's supply runs from its capital to its units. So these units will have good supply. There's every unit here has um, a direct line to the capital. Um, here there's pretty good supply. Again, it has to kind of weave its way around, but still good supply. Um, if there was to be like a line that was cut off through these three states. This would not be encircled. They have ports, especially in Barcelona. So the supply would go from Madrid to Valencia or to Barcelona. However, here, there's no ports and there's no direct line to the capital. So these units are cut off from supply. They are encircled right now. Um, they do not, they will not have, I can't say the intel, but um, they do not have the supply debuff. Or they have the low supply debuff, but they don't have the encircled debuff. When a unit is surrounded only on one tile, that means it has the encircled debuff and it will get a negative to its offensive and defensive stats. It's incredibly good to encircle, you know, in one tile. So these units, I want to get them to the front fast. Um, so I'm going to strategically redeploy by pressing B or clicking this strategic redeployment button. And I will click that tile there and they will go very fast, especially because they are A, tanks, and B, they are strategically redeploying. Look at them go. All right, now I'll turn, press B again, and it'll turn it off. They'll walk up there and they'll gain some org. What I'm going to do is press shift and click there, and they will move immediately to attack this next tile. They are currently getting attacked 
from this direction because this unit is trying to attack this direction while it's getting attacked as well. This is causing it to have, or causing it, sh it should have a negative debuff, but this is the battle screen. Um, when you click this, these little um, bubbles, either the red, yellow, or green, you can see the different abilities here. You can see the amount of soft attack, hard attack, and breakthrough for the offense, and the amount of soft attack, um, hard attack, and defense for the um, defenders. Um, and so from here, you can also see the different generals that are leading each side, the planes, the damage and shot down, also the um, bonuses of each general that are active currently, the amount of units that are in combat, and the ones that are trying to um, deploy into the battle, the width of the battle, and again, this is where division width makes a difference, because this is 80. Every tile is worth 40, but since there are two tiles in combat here, this tile here and this tile here, it's 80. Um, you can also see that because the intel advantages is higher for the Republicans, they have an intel bonus, but they do not have an air superiority bonus. The enemy has air superiority, so there's going to be a debuff for them. There's also a tactics list you can look at, which the different people can use for their attack and defense, which will give different modifiers and bonuses. I've never really looked at these because you can't really choose your own tactics. It's kind of what the general will choose based on his level and the doctrine you've researched, which again, we'll talk about at a later point in this video. But what we want to do is we want to get this unit to stop attacking and we want to get to this tile here as quickly as possible so we can circle this unit and he can not pose a threat to us anymore, but looks like he's probably just going to retreat because he's running up org unless we get there first and overrun him. And we've done so. And now, if you look here, it's red for a second. It shouldn't be. Um, and he's dead. Oh, he's not dead. What is going on here? Hold on. So, as you can see, this these are the two buff debuffs you want your enemy to have. Right here. The multiple combat and encirclement. So you're, the enemy is both attacking and defending at the same time, so it's going to cause it to have a negative 50% attack and defense. And the encirclement penalty, meaning it's only trapped on one tile, its attack and defense are cut by 30% as well. So this is in overall a negative 80% to their all of their stats. This unit is not going to last long. It cannot retreat anywhere, so it will just die, and then the entirety of its unit will be added to the casualty list. I don't think that means they all get killed, but it means they all stop existing on the map, which is good because the less units an enemy has, the quicker it is for you to defeat them. Now, something to know about tanks, they're not really good on defense. Right now, they're holding up all right, just because, again, these are very basic, like, 10 with or under Spanish divisions. Most comp games would not be able to send tanks to Spain, but I wanted to use them for just some examples. Tanks also receive a bonus when, um, pause right there for a second. Um, tanks will also receive a bonus when attacking with infantry, so make sure to also support your tanks with infantry. Um, so there, what I did is, when I was moving these two tanks into a position, I pressed S because I had both them selected, and it cut it in half. So it selected this tank division, kept it moving forward, and I selected this tank division, and kept it here. If I were to move this to tank division with it, of course this area would have more defense, but it would leave my back door open for this division to possibly cut me off here, and if this division wasn't there, I'd be encircled. Again, a very minor example for a very small risk, but it is an example that you don't want to overextend yourself. I've seen way too many people overextend themselves in somewhere like Russia. In, like this happened in real life. The 9th Army was extended over into Stalingrad. They were cut off and completely destroyed, and that was the turning fight turning point in the fight against the Germans for the Russians in the Second World War. So again, overextending yourself when you micro is not a good idea. You want to take it nice and slow and know when to press the attack and know when to sit and wait for the right moment to occur. For this instance, we've circled two Spanish divisions. That's pretty pog. Let's just kill him and move on. So let's just kill him. Oh, so sometimes now that you can see this is happening right here. If you click on both of these battles, I'm fighting in two different combats. So in this situation, it's going to be best for me to stop fighting and attack from a different tile. That way this unit can focus solely on defense. Another thing with tanks is, is that they have armor. If an enemy division cannot pierce the tank's armor, it will lose less org and take less damage, basically just making it stronger. It's the way that armor does what it can do. Um, 
this is why Space Marines are really strong. It's because if they have an armor value high enough in a regular infantry division, it's overpowering and it'll cause units to basically become defensive monsters. Um, so yeah, this enemy unit is receiving low supply and in multiple combat, but our tank is still not doing that well. Probably because we are attacking into a mountain with a German light tank. Oh, there was the little red thing you saw popped up was overrun. When a unit is attacked and retreats and the tile they're retreating into is taken before they can get there, um, they are overrun. Which means the unit is immediately deleted off the battlefield like they are encircled. This only happens when you have very fast units like tanks or if you have a bonus to make your units even faster uh, um, overall or in certain territories. So even though this is a red number, the amount of org as you can see is lowering. These two bars on units are different, um, basically, signs of their strength. The organization is basically the health. You want to call it health, you want to call it health. Um, that is the division's um, HP. The strength is basically how much equipment they have. I don't know why it's called organization and strength and not health and equipment, but that's literally what they are. The green bar is health. The orange bar is their equipment. So this unit is running out of equipment, but it's very low on health. So if we continue the attack, even though we are red, we should be able to kill them quite easily. Now, unit can regain org if it retreats to a tile where it still has right, supply. But however, there's no way for them to retreat. The Spanish divisions will just die. Um, so let's finish all this little encirclement and we can push other places. Um, I think from then I'll be done talking about microing because this is a very basic um, overview of it. Again, you can see here. Um, if your general has a higher um, recon value, you will have initiative, which will give you a better attack. And also, um, if your general has a higher level in general, you'll have more initiative. Also, attacking from multiple directions. As you can see here, 4, 8, 12, 16. So this should be 160 combat width. But however, it's 200 because it includes this tile here as well. So 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. So this comes out to 200 combat width. So again, making sure your divisions are always in a multiple of 40, either 40 width, 20 width, or 10 width, are very important for um, good division templates, which again, we'll talk about in a minute. I'm gonna kind of finish these off. And it's a mountain tile. And also I think during the Spanish Civil War, yeah, the unplanned offensive, so this will take a bit of time. So in the Spanish Civil War, you kind of want to wait until the Spain plans certain areas to attack, but there's a very good AI that actually let the Republicans push out of the north and then encircled behind them, so very beneficial. This will be very beneficial in the comp game. Hopefully they fuse the parties, because everyone forgets to do that. Yeah, if you're playing Spain in a comp game, do not forget to fuse the parties, because that's one of the worst things you can do. At least in the Spanish tree, if I want to talk about one thing, get to this quickly because if not, the Carlist will uprise and it'll be very difficult. Um, yeah, it will not be good. Yeah. See how long it takes to encircle to get one encircled division? That's the whole effect of the Spanish unplanned offensive. That's why, you, as Spain, you really want to get rid of these unplanned offensive in areas you want to push with you and your volunteer for your allies. Um, as best as possible. So, now they're not getting here. Or actually, that was in the right spot because in this tile. Okay, that works. And you can, if you click this tile, you can also see the damage done to enemy divisions with your casts, the amount that you have in the area. And they've done well. Looks like actually our casts are upgraded to train. That's nice. All right. That's enough about micro, I believe, for now. Um, We'll talk more about army composition and army stuff later. Let's go back to what we were talking about up here. We were done with intelligence agency again. We've already, our uh, collaboration government is actually already underway. Its duration is already taking off. Um, excuse me, let's talk about research. Another long-winded section here. Um, we're going to talk about the different sections of research and what to research in each. Now, the way I usually start research in any game is I go industry, basic machine tools, construction, and engineering. Basically, I want to make my industry better and I also want this because it gives me a research speed. Now after that, you kind of have an option because the synthetic technology is a little ahead of time and they're not that good right now. 
Um, for Germany, maybe to get one of these early, if you're doing a comp game, might work. Um, you don't want to go for these. It's too far away. Then we start getting into other things. Um, any nation, unless you're playing an air controller, is always going to need good army doctrine. And it's really good to focus on one of those. So usually I like to start down an army doctrine path. It depends on what you're doing. Um, I guess it's time to delve into the army doctrines. So this is a big discussion about your army and how it's supposed to work. You have four types. Mobile warfare, superior firepower, and grand battle plan, as well as mass assault doctrine. Now... Each different type is important for different types of nations. Um, generally, most people tend to go superior firepower unless they have a certain other type of way that they want to play with a nation. Um, we'll start from left to right. Mobile warfare is good for tank armies. And now I'm not talking about like you have 48 divisions and then you have five more that are heavy tanks. I'm talking about your army is majoritively composed of tank divisions. You have a you have, you know, you're playing South Africa in a comp game and you only build heavy tanks. Or you're playing, um, you're doing the same thing with like a Canada or a Hungary or whatever. Your army, the units that you're using primarily and the units that you mostly are making are tanks. If, you all, if you're playing a, like a meme game and you just make all your divisions tanks, I mean, this would be the doctrine for you. It gives buffs to tanks and armor variants. Um, most of the times you want to go down Blitzkrieg more often because it gives more bonuses to tanks through breakthrough. That 20% breakthrough right there on Armored Spearhead is disgusting. I've seen tanks do very well with that. However, there's not many infantry bonuses, so it really cramp your infantry. Uh, Modern Blitzkrieg is very good um, for more attacking, while Desperate Defense will give you 5% recruitable as well as um, some negative, or some, de some debuffs to the enemy garrison, so you'll basically have less or, you sorry, your garrison, your um, partisans will do more damage to enemy garrisons, um, which is interesting. But this side is not very good unless you're really struggling for manpower, because this is all it does um, is give you more manpower at these two. While these will give you um, organization bonuses, um, a new tactic, backhand blow, um, which gives you extra movement, extra damage. Um, which is I'm sorry, but it's actually you're a defending tactic, so it's like a um, Minor encirclement on a front line, um, which is very good. And this last one, Modern Blitzkrieg, which is insane for your tank breakthrough and organization. Um, so again, Mobile Warfare, I would recommend this if you're playing a Tank Canada, a Tank Hungary, a Tank Romania, um, a, a competitive South Africa, where usually you go tanks. Um, some Brazils even do tanks. It's, you know, majority of your army's tanks, use it. Superior firepower is generally considered the best doctrine to go down um, because of this right here. Integrated support, which is amazing. Sometimes people use dispersed support, uh, support if you're using like an Australia that uses some weird marine templates that with a lot of artillery because it gives you massive amounts of recovery rate and soft attack for your artillery. However, the integrated support is phenomenal because it allows you to put more support divisions into your um, templates without losing organization. Again, organization's health. Usually when you put support divisions into your templates, you lose health. You lose org. However, this counterbalances that with an extra organization here and here. So the support companies will actually integrate into your army and be better for your army because they won't do as much negative debuffs to your support. Um, you'll still get um, bonuses to tanks. Um, Airland Battle and Shock and Awe both are really good. Um, Airland Battle is really nice because of this last one you get more air superiority, which is an extra 20%. Most people tend to go down this path, but don't underestimate Shock and Awe. It has a lot of bonuses, both offensive and defensively, while Airland's mostly offensive. Um, these bonuses at the Shock and Awe stage are very nice. Again, plus 5% hard attack and soft attack for uh, our... Infantry and Mott and Mech, which is motorized and mechanized, and artillery support and line. So your artillery support and line is going to be even better. While all frontline battalions are going to get an extra 5% soft attack. So basically all battalions, which is the individual markers, infantry battalion are these individual markers. All those individual markers are going to get 5% extra soft attack. Um, so then Grand Battle Plan is generally considered the worst out of the four. Don't take that in the wrong way though 
it's still very good in certain situations and it does its job better than all the others in those situations mainly in defense and with infantry pushes grand battle plan is kind of this old school method of fighting um, generally this was used by japan and italy in the base game um, is what their ai historical focus would go down this focus on grand battle plan um it's very good for entrenchment more entrenchment you have the bigger buffs you're going to get to your defense when someone's attacking you um so the thing about micro is that if you move a unit when it's fully entrenched and it attacks it will generally lose all of its entrenchment and have to re-entrench which will take time and allow your units to make a counter attack which can be very beneficial so this will let your units have a quicker entrenchment and more entrenchment and will also give you a ton of max planning. Um, as you can see here, Japan kind of uses this. This is literally an image of Japan going to different areas. Um, if you're if you want to go this division path, you need 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 to have signal companies because they give you initiative, and this area will bonus will give you increase to your signal companies because of the planning. Um, yeah, the reconnaissance and the reinforce rate and the signal companies become very, very integral because of the amount of planning that you go through. Basically, the more planning that's done, the quicker planning can be done, the quicker it's going to uh, be executed, the more bonuses your army will get. So this is all about careful and thorough planning. Um, this mainly uses infantry through infiltration, while this uses more of a modern mechanized type of grand battle plan. So yeah, this max planning is very, very nice for coordinated assaults. Now, mass assault doctrine is um, interesting, to say the least. Um, this is kind of the, you know, fuck around, find out, and throw everybody at the front line kind of thing. And it's not that simplistic and barbaric, but it kind of boils down to somewhere near that. Um, it gives you a lot of bonuses for defense as well as recruitable population. Um, then the two sides of it through mass mob and deep battle are pretty different. Mass mob generally focuses on infantry and strength in numbers. So it'll give you some bonuses that will help you um, have more infantry on the tiles, like less division attrition, more damage to the enemy, um, more infantry recovery rate and reinforce rate, um, more organization. It'll also give you this, an extra recruitable population factor, and um, guerrilla tactics, rest out of supply. So again, it's very infantry focused. Well, this is also infantry focused, but is still has a lot of tank bonuses in it as well. So this is like a Russia path. This is a China path, if you want to think of it historically. It's important to look at these focuses here. Division combat with minus 0.4%, same here. When we get to division templates, I'll show you that this is actually very beneficial or defense um, when it comes to these human wave offensive and vast offensives um, sounds odd but it'll very much help you so I like to go superior firepowers Germany so that's what I'll do here all right let's see here now we'll go ahead and move on to diplomacy now diplomacy there's not much to talk about in this tab you can just see who likes who um, your opinion of them and their opinion of you again this really only helps ai and trading and how they're going to want to talk to your nation as far as like mutual protection packs asking for docking rights a lot of nitpicky stuff that's not really necessary um you kind of also see this if you just like right then left click your country and you can see who hates and who likes you again no one truly hates this that's that much yet um so but again this tab i rarely use this diplomacy tab it's not that important to me. Um, yeah, I've, I've rarely opened this. Um, so I'm going to move on to trade. Um, trade is important because it helps you get the resources you need to build different equipment. You can't build certain equipment. You can't equip your division. You lose the war. A lot of World War II has fought over resources, um, mainly in the Asian theater. So um, all of them are pretty simplistic except for oil, which I'll go over here. Um, basically, you need a certain amount of aluminum in order to produce the equipment that you're producing. We'll look at production really quick. You need 20 steel to produce this many infantry equipment. It's two steel per infantry equipment, so if I increase it, it's going to go up by two steel every time. So basically, we need to trade for the stuff that we need. 
Um, right now, if you see that it's yellow, it means we're, we're trading for too much. We don't really need this much. So we're trading, we have a default trade with Sweden. So let's just press this button here. So this will click, it'll set the number of um, factories that we need to trade with the nation in order to keep our amount of that resource at the best possible number. Not too much, not too little, at the, at the uh, correct number. So I click send, it immediately changes it. I'm no longer giving them a factory. I have the right amount of tungsten. If I start, it'll drop. Yep, it'll drop to three. Now, we're at negative rubber. So our production of stuff that needs rubber, see, zero rubber, zero rubber, zero rubber, it's decreased. So we need to have the right amount of rubber. So we'll have a reduced speed of all of these production, so planes and also cars. So we will need to require rubber. So let's trade with a nation. Now, when you see nations, they are sorted by the amount of rubber that they have. So the Dutch East Indies is going to have a crap ton of rubber. We can buy 184 of them if we wanted to, but that'd be ridiculous. Um, the one at the bottom is going to be the least amount, while the grayed out ones we cannot trade with. France is producing rubber, but is not exporting any, so they can't really export any because of their trade law. So let's look at what nation we want to trade with. Now, if we're th talking about a comp game, you don't want to trade as an Axis member to the Allies because when you trade, as you can see here, it's going to give them one factory. Not good. So let's pick a nation that's either neutral or that we're not going to fight against. Dutch Indies, kind of part of the Allies. British Malaya, definitely Allies. United Kingdom, the leader of the Allies. Brazil goes with the Allies. Siam, neutral, goes also with Japan usually if it's a player. So then, boom, we click that. They're going to give us seven... Rubber for one factory. Now, the important thing to realize is, is that if they're not able to trade us the amount of rubber, we're going to get reduced returns. And you'll see a little pop-up for that. That Siam can't trade us enough rubber. Um, so sometimes we have to trade with somebody else. I like to trade with the Dutch East Indies. just because that doesn't go to a player. No one ever plays Dutch East Indies. And no one ever plays the Netherlands. It's not going to a player. And Japan usually takes it. So it's technically giving factories to them in a backwards kind of way. But it helps. So Siam might not be able to give us all the rubber, so we'll trade with the Dust East Indies. It's not perfect, it's not great, but it's fine. This does require convoys. Um, as the amount of convoys you see here are the amount of convoys that will need to be taken from your stockpile in order to trade continually and will be constantly used up with this. Um, when you see a dash, that means no convoys are needed. So the British, the British Malaya land trade route, I don't know how they did this, but I guess it goes up through here. And they, whatever. Doesn't matter, you don't need convoys. So it can be beneficial to choose to trade with somebody because you don't need convoys and they can't get raided. Um, speaking of raiding, let's quickly go over that. When you're in this trade tab, you can click different, or actually you don't even need to be in the trade tab, but when you're in the trade tab, you can see where your supply is going from. Now, again, as I showed you supply, if units are here in this, enclave of Germany right now they need to be supplied from a port so the supply is going from Berlin to this port here in Mecklenburg all the way over to Konigsberg to get the supply now this is trade right here this well the blue is trade the white supply so this this is the route that our supply is taking for our troops that are currently fighting in the Spanish um, Civil War now the blue is the trade that is being traded to British Malaya as you can see, it's going through these different territories. Or, or trade with the Dutch East Indies, rather. So let's say the war started, and for some reason the Dutch East Indies are still able to trade with. Just don't ask questions, just let's say that. And we don't want to get raided by the British Navy. Now, it's most likely the British Navy is going to have ships in these areas around their home islands and um, Ireland. Um, so what we can do is we can click some of these different buttons in the bottom left in order to decrease the amount, or decrease the um, amount of convoys are going through this location so green means anything is allowed to pass through yellow means don't pass through it unless you are directly ordered and red means like don't just never touch it don't look at it no so generally i would do this in my setup and when you go to trade tab you can see oh this is red so that means the ai is going to plan a new course just like that around so the other issue that comes up is if you limit areas and there's no way for you to get any trade, you won't be able to trade. So don't limit your areas entirely. It's generally good to do this as Germany to keep your ships and convoys from getting raided a ton. Um, and then you can also like limit this area here and that will force you to trade all the way around the horn. 
Of course I am. So, again, keeping your convoy safe is good because if you don't, you will lose war support and stability constantly and it will bring your nation to your knees. Believe me. Now, oil. Previously, before man the guns, oil was a required resource to build any machinery. Now, oil is required to make fuel. Basically, oil is converted into fuel at a certain rate. You can increase that rate by going here and researching fuel refining. Um, when you research fuel refining, um, your fuel gain per oil will increase, and also you will get more oil from your refineries, which we'll talk about in the construction tab. When we're talking about trade, you want to make sure that when you trade for oil, you need to get more fuel. We're decreasing in fuel, and we're only using a couple tanks and planes. That's not good. So let's trade with a nation that's going to give us some some oil back. We're going to trade with Venezuela. Well, let's just trade like three. We get 24 oil, and then our oil should be increasing. There you go. So we'll fill up in exactly 163, 150. It's decreasing. So we're getting a good amount of oil. Maybe a little too much, we could decrease that, but for the video's sake, we'll just keep going. So basically, this shows our amount of fuel in gallons. So we have 258,000 gallons of fuel with a daily gain of 1.4 thousand. Um, we From 26 oil, we're getting 1.3 1 thousand oil. Basically, it shows the amount that you're getting and the amount that you're expending through the Army, Air, and Navy. Um, you just want to kind of always keep your fuel in a positive or stagnating gain. That way you don't ever run out. Because if you run out, you will suffer huge debuffs to your army that uses oil, such as motorized or tank divisions, to your air force, and to your navy. Um, that's trade for you. Right there. Plain and simple. The big areas of the world that have trade, Dutch East Indies and Southeast Asia are going to be great for, oil, uh, for rubber mostly and a little bit of oil. Um, New Caledonia and turkey are amazing for chromium as well as south africa South Africa has a decent amount of chromium here as well that they can increase um, as far as steel france and germany have a ton aluminum is really uh numerous in hungary as well as parts of italy um and i believe the uk has a decent bit tungsten the iberian peninsula and also angola I think, no, not in Goa. But the Iberian Peninsula and the mainland Portugal, huge amounts of tungsten. So when a Spain usually takes Portugal, they're just a tungsten uh, producer for the Axis. There's also a decent amount of oil here in the Caucasus, which is Russia's oil supply. Um, there's a lot of resources in the Guangxi clique for Japan to take, as well as rubber in the Southeast Asian areas. Um, and then, yeah, oil, you know. America, oil here. It's also important to know that with uh, Mexico, these oil imports are actually belonging to America and Britain, respectively. There's also some, there's a decent amount of chromium in Central America, and there's a lot of oil in Colombia and Venezuela. Um, I wonder if the USA did anything about, oh, right, they did. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's basically where a lot of the resources lie in different areas. Um, it's, it's also... A lot of people underestimate Sweden. Sweden's really good with resources in this upper tile here in Lapland. Um, but yeah, um, but as I really kind of skipped over a lot of the research, I went really quick. Um, let's actually go back and look through some of them. So we'll go through each tab. Infantry equipment. Um, these are the big blocks you see here. The uh, Gewehr, the Carabiner, MP38 and 43. Those are things you can actually produce. While these little ones are actually just bonuses. These are very good down here. Heart attack for regular infantry divisions is phenomenal. Um, now, mobile infantry. It's always good to research the motorized infantry because um, when you get support companies, any of these will require motorized infantry. Um, motorized infantry can also be put into rocket artillery, which is, this is, wow, I've never seen the German one. That's actually stupid looking. Okay. Um, but, um, they can turn to rocket artillery, but again, they're very necessary for the support battalion, which are, again, very good. Um, another thing I don't see a lot of people doing is you don't need to produce mechanized. They're very good, but when you research this, the hardness, so basically the amount of armor, kind of, um, it's a reduction of um, soft attack, basically, increases by 100%. It's doubled on any of the motorized divisions. Um, so these are mechanized, and these are... Amphibious mechanized, which I believe count 
are they special forces? I believe they are special forces here. These Amtrak divisions are basically um, mechanized divisions that will are able to swim, quote unquote. Um, these divisions will be good supplementary uh, divisions with your amphibious tanks if you make them, which are very good, by the way. Amphibious tanks are amazing if you are able to produce them. Um, let's see here. Then you down here you have armored cars, which I believe these are still listed as special forces. I don't know if they require the special forces cap. These are very good at suppression, um, and they're very cheap to make. Um, they're not really good in combat as well, but they are quite nice. Um, there is actually a version that is good for piercing, which can be used in like mechanized or motorized or mechanized divisions. But again, I've rarely used these. Honestly, they added them in the man the or the La Resistance DLC. I've rarely used them. Um, then you have your three types of special forces: Marines, Paratroopers, and Mountain Infantry. Marines and paratroopers um, are have special abilities that they're good at. Mountain infantry are just all around good and god tier, and I mean god tier on mountains. Um, these bonuses give them more uh, soft attack and organization. Um, and down here, you have your special forces tab, which will give you um, bonuses to your special forces. So after this first one, you have the opportunity of either going um, better special forces, as in they have better acclimation factors to the hot and cold, and but they also have a debuff to their training time, or you literally just get uh, more special forces. So the cap, the capacity multiplier increases. Um, basically what this means is that you can't just build special forces only. There is a limit to the amount of special forces that you can build based on the amount of divisions you currently have. So when you have a ton of divisions, you can build more special forces. If you have less divisions, you can't build as many special forces. So it's important to realize how many special forces you can you field and to use them wisely because special forces are very helpful in the right hands. Um, so that basically covers this section. When we go to support companies, these are very important, especially for the play style that I like to play, which is support um, superior firepower. Research, okay, engineer companies give you more entrenchment. Recon companies give you more reconnaissance. Military police are only good for garrison divisions, which will reduce the amount of um, resistance coming from a territory. We'll talk about those later. Maintenance companies, I tend to only use in tanks because they help tanks from breaking down, making you lose less tanks, making you have to produce less or have more tanks as surplus. I never use field hospitals. Um, they basically reduce the amount of casualties you take, and they are very... Limited in the amount that they can reduce. It's basically not enough bang for your buck to produce them. Um, and you can only have five, um, uh, what are they, uh, five support companies in a single division. So it's kind of like the odd man out. Logistics company, you use less resources. Basically, you save more. It's basically just like the recycling company, I guess, if you want to call it that. They keep your divisions from using too many resources. They keep your divisions in better shape and more supply. And then we go to signal companies, which give your divisions more um, initiative, better combat. They're able to enter fighting quickly, more quickly. Um, it's just a good buff for your divisions to have. Um, again, we'll talk about division templates in a minute when we get over to that recruit and deploy tab. Armor. You have a couple different types of armor. You have light, heavy, medium, modern, and amphibious. So light tanks are going to be the fastest. They're going to have... Actually, I... Yes, I can. So let's look at... Look at this series. So the Leopard, the Panzer, and the Tiger. So you can see here, I, cl I should click to bring these all up. You can see the difference between the multiple. So you have basically, you know, quick and fast, slow and heavy, and a good medium. Literally. Pun intended, I guess. Um, so you can see the armor increases steadily. So it's going to take more piercing and heart attack to break this division. It's going to take less to break this. Again, that armor bonus, like I showed you in micro, was very beneficial. Um, so the speed decreases as you go on. So these divisions will be able to encircle a bit faster, but will have a harder time breaking through. So again, you can kind of see the point of going for these divisions here. They're fast enough to encircle the divisions, and they have just enough armor to keep themselves from getting penetrated by other light weapons and other infantry divisions that would cause them damage. Um, so it's a good medium. A lot of times I tend to fall toward this side of either going heavies or mediums. Um, but again, the production cost of a heavy is over double that of a medium. So you can produce more mediums or just less heavies that are stronger. Um, there's also super heavies, which are, uh, 
yeah, um, yeah, they're huge. 145 armor, massive breakthrough. Their heart attack's huge. Their soft attack's huge. Their max speed is abysmal, and their production cost is disgusting. Um, this is like building a destroyer on wheels. Um, if you can do it, Godspeed, and if that direction gets encircled, your game's over. Um, those are basically the main tank types. If you go this, and I mean, this, like, just. I can't say don't do it because it's a great meme if you do do it, but like Godspeed and good luck because it's it's not fun. They hurt. Um, amphibious tanks count as um, special forces, but they are phenomenal at attacking through rivers and marshes as well as amphibious landings. Um, they are great for D-Day, um, for invading Japan, for naval invading, even as Germany, like trying to naval invade Britain. Like these things will land into coastal forts and they will look at the coastal forts and turn a blind cheek and just go right past them these are phenomenal tanks and i, I every time i use these and i use them in the way they're supposed to be used they're great like even i remember one germany game i actually built marines and those tank divisions and i was able to break through the stalin line with just those divisions like they're phenomenal um they're great for attacking across rivers which is something that people try to hold a lot um in different areas so um artillery you have three types Regular artillery, which is good at soft attack. Anti-air, which is good at doing a passive debuff to air. That's the enemies above you, which will slowly degrade their planes. Mostly close air support rather than fighters. But it's really good for Russia to be good at these if they do a no air build. Um, this will also improve the no anti-air on your battleships and um, other ships. And anti-tank, which is good for putting your infantry divisions to pierce enemy tanks and keep them from getting that armor bonus. Rock artillery is harder to produce, but gives you more soft attack and is very, uh, very potent. We already covered land doctrine. Um, we'll call it naval at a different time, but basically you have to build these different hulls. There's destroyers, cruisers, battleships, carriers, submarines, and different miscellaneous bonuses. This is where you do your landing craft for um, naval invasions, so that's very important to have. Um... And their naval doctrine, the basic ones, if I just want to quickly cover over this because I don't want to say something that's wrong, you have old school, big fleets, big ships, big guns, submarine warfare, wolf packs, stuff like that, new way, America versus Japan, carrier fighting. Um, then we come to air. A couple different types of airplanes. You have the main fighter, when you go down the center path, with close air support and naval bomber. A heavy fighter, a tactical bomber, a strategic bomber, and a scout plane. So what do each of them do? Let's take a look and just go straight across the board here. We'll compare all of these at the same time. The scout planes, I guess. So let's just take a look at all of these. Okay. So as you can see here, we have the main fighter plane. This is your bread and butter of planes. This is the plane that you need to build most often that's going to get you your air support. They can do air superiority and interception. Stop enemies from doing different bombing raids or bombing runs and also get air superiority and basically have the air. You own the air. This is the necessary plane in order for your bombers to do whatever you want to do. These are the guys that go in, clear the air, and allow you to do what you need to do. Um, your close air support are not really going to be good for naval targeting, but they're going to be great for ground attack, which you can see right here is 10. It's the highest of any of these, even higher than these bombers right here with their ground attack of six, or these strategic bombers with their, they don't even have ground attacks, not able to do it. But that close air support is what you want them on, and at higher levels, these things will win you wars. If you're doing a land push, it's usually good to have these two types of fighters on you. Naval bombers are great at attacking um, naval ships, um, from bases anywhere they can attack naval ships in ports or naval ships in the open water they're phenomenal at taking out um ships at any rate um they just need to have air superiority with them or they would get very easily shot down by enemy fighters they're big bulky they have torpedoes with them they're not very agile so they can be taken down very easily by these fighters so they need to have fighter cover then when we go to i believe these are heavy fighters yes these are heavy fighters when we go to this heavy fighter up here these are fighters with a larger amount of range, but they cost a lot more to produce. Actually, a decent bit more to produce. Um, they have a higher air attack. 
um, more air superiority, um, more naval attack and agility. They're, they're better planes all around, um, but their agility is going to be far less. And if your agility is far less on a plane, you're not going to win air superiority as easily. The advantage of these is their range. It's almost double that of a regular plane, which is really good to compare or to combine with these strategic bombers. Strategic bombers can do strategic bombing, which is a type of bombing that allows you to target enemy industry complexes. Um, regular tactical bombers can do that, but they're not as good. Generally, I honestly find tactical bombers as one of the worst planes in the game because it's a shitty me like a shitty medium gr or middle ground between a close air support and attack or in a strategic bomber. If you want to target civilian industry and other industry and, and, and like um, infrastructure, you use um, oh it's escaping me the uh, strategic bombers. Sorry, use the strategic bombers. If you want to attack land, use the cast. You this is just as like this like bastard child of these two that's just like doesn't isn't good at either really. So like garbage. Um, these scout planes are good at getting reconnaissance and seeing. They're the only ones that can perform air recon, so they can gather intel. Um, they have a decent amount of range and agility. They will get shot down if they don't have air superiority, but um, they're cheap to make, good reliability. Um, an odd plane, never really built them, never really needed to, but they're all right. Um, that's basically planes. Um, once you get to jet engines, your tactical bombers actually will become your jet bombers which will do different things but you will actually get a jet strategic bomber and then your fighters will become this so if you're going jet engines it is good to get tactical bombers to this level because then they're the only thing that can do close air support um air doctrine air doctrine there's three different ones strategic destruction battlefield support and operational integrity strategic destruction is going to be like the american type way to go you know dresden hamburg you know cities reduced to rubble a ton of good strategic bombing bon bombing bonuses this is basically nighttime or strategic just regular strategic bombing bonus i usually go this path if i go this and then depending on how it's going if like i'm winning the air war a ton i just want to bomb more shit i go this way or if i just want more superiority i'll go this way if i'm not winning as well um operational integrity is good for tactical bombers i don't use this a ton but it's really good for, where is it? I think it's the naval bonus. Uh, yeah, the naval, I think the naval bonus in this one used to be the biggest. But now it's this one, okay. This one's the best. So this one, honestly, I feel like is the worst because it makes your tactical bombers better, but I feel like it's just the worst one out of all of them. I like Battlefield Support the best because it makes your casts really good. It has great bonuses for casts. Um, I generally go left side and then down the center. Um, you can get both of these. These are not mutually exclusive. It only has one path, basically, either more air superiority, mission efficiency, and more experience, or more aces and experience. So I tend to like more um, efficiency in your air superiority than in aces, because aces will come and go. They can die. Um, I mean, I talked about engineering. This is radar. This is research speed. Um, and these are comes down to ships these are basically fire control systems and ships you have your atomic research which is just a research speed buff your nuclear reactors which you can build to build nukes and then your nukes which you need a strategic bomber to drop again i say this again you need, to, you need strategic bombers to drop nukes and you need to have air superiority in all the tiles leading up from where the strategic bomber is taking off to where it's landing oh boy a lot of explaining okay now industry synthetic oil down here this basically gives you more fuel gain per oil and more storage capacity for oil while this area will allow you to produce synthetic factories and give bonuses to them so you have one type of synthetic factory here and it will produce one oil and give you um or sorry one rubber and give you passive fuel gain so this will basically give you more rubber per factory and more fuel gain per factory um your production efficiency cap will um, talk more about this when we go to the production tab but basically it basically makes your production have a higher capacity so you can produce more and more and more and more and more um, and then we get down here um, flexible or streamlined line streamlined gives you more of a cap and more growth so your growth towards your cap is higher and your cap is higher or your retention is higher retention is basically when you switch over from one type to the other you retain more so, like, if I were to take this, and don't do this at the beginning of the game, this will kill your retention. As you can see, 
we're maxed out. Our efficiency is capped because we're at the cap of our production efficiency. Um, if I were to click this and switch, we lose a ton because we don't have a ton of retention. That, what I showed you, that flexible line is going to be able to give you more retention. You'll never get 100% retention, but it will give you more of the retention in order to lessen the damage from switching between types. Again, that doesn't have to mean switching between support, inf support equipment and infantry equipment. It could literally be switching from one tank type to the next tank type. That can reduce your efficiency. Um, construction, construction speed, resource efficiency. So basically that gives you more resource, resources per tile where there are resources. So it's just a bonus for that. And then here in the center, well, I'll talk about these real quick, conversion. Basically you convert mills to sieves, sieves to mills quicker. Um, the industry here, actually, I think, can you convert back and, and oh yeah, convert both. I, as you can see, I just I just don't convert. Um, now here, this is where it really comes down to it. Concentrated and dispersed. Now, concentrated gives you more max factories in a state. Actually, the same amount of max factories in a state. I believe it gets higher down here. No, it's not. Um, so max factories for state is 20 for each. Now, factory output is 15 and dockyard output is 10. So for this, factory output is 10. This gives you no extra, and it gives you 10% dockyard output. So the only bonus you're getting with concentrated is extra factory output. And it's 5% for each of these levels. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So an extra 25% compared to this, which is going to keep you at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So this is 15, 30, 60, 75. So you're going to get an extra 25% factory output, which is just raw production. More, more shit. You know, more. Um, dispersed industry is going to give you, um, more retention to your production efficiency. So again, if you switch back and forth between things, it could be more retention. it will give you more base production efficiency and reduce your bomb vulnerability. So if you're going to get, you know, strategically bombed a ton, this is going to help you reduce a lot of that vulnerability. That is research A to Z. Sorry, I kind of jumped around there, but there you go. Now we've done trade. In diplomacy, we're in research, intelligence agency. Let's move on to construction. Now, this tab is important because you need to figure out what you're doing and where with your factories. Civilian factories build everything here, everything, including other civilian factories. So, up here, you can see how many factories we're using, and like nine of them, and 32 that we have owned. Nine are going to consumer goods, and four are using going to trade goods. You see our construction speed bonus here. We've researched no construction technology, so it's only 5% because of our limited exports, which is giving us a 5% construction speed bonus. Go back to construction. Infrastructure will give you more fuel capacity. It'll also give you um, more resources on a tile. So like if I see this tile here, it's a seven out of 10. If I were to shift click and that would start the production on it, it would give me more resources. If those resources are natural. If you make a synthetic factory and you want to increase the amount of oil there, I don't think I have any synthetics right now, but it wouldn't increase the amount. Um, also, troops will get more supply on those tiles. Um, it will make building there easier. So, like, let's say I want to build a factory. This is a 80% bonus. This is a 60% bonus, a 70% bonus because of the level of infrastructure. 8 out of 10 infrastructure is an 80% bonus. 7 out of 10 infrastructure is a 70% bonus you can see the pattern from here. So a hundred, like, um, what is it? 10 out of 10 infrastructure is a hundred percent bonus. It's made twice as fast, which is really good for Germany to go with the Reich Autobahn, which gives you maximum infrastructure in four different territories, which is phenomenal for both your industry and your resources. Um, air bases will basically give you amount of planes per area. Um, I believe it's 200 planes per level, so this should have 12,000. Yes, 200 planes per airbase level. So 12,000, 10,000, 12,000, 12,600. You know, you can see the pattern from there. Anti-air is basically stagnant anti-air that will give you debuffs. Uh, to give debuffs to the enemy air as they fly over, doing damage, taking down some of their planes. Radar will help you um, increase the area of units that you can see help you get air superiority and also give you bonuses during combat where the radar can see you can increase radar through this tab here and all the way down give you high levels of radar which we have to build higher but it will give you better chance for anti-air to hit and also give you um a wider spread of your radar um 
These two combinations right here, anti-air and radar, are phenomenal together. Um, civilian factories build everything. So usually people build civilian factories until a certain date in comp games like Germany. You usually build until 38. Then you switch to mills, which then will you use. Will, I'll show you how to use in the production tab. Dockyards can only be built on tiles at board of the ocean, and they will be used to build convoys and other ships. Synthetic refineries will give you production of rubber and oil and can be upgraded as I showed you before. Fuel silos will give you more fuel capacity. Uh, rocket sites, you need to re research the correct rocket, rocketry information and build rockets and they will do passive damage to enemy enemies in certain areas based on what you put them on. They can also target enemy civilian economy and or they can target enemy economy in any way they want to really. Um, infrastructure, civilian factories, the whole nine yards and they do very well at that. And nuclear reactors will passively build your nukes once you have the right technology. Uh, naval bases basically will increase the amount of, um, uh, what's it called, um, supply you're able to get out of that port. So, like, let's say you had a ton of units in here, they were losing low supply, you increase the port and the infrastructure, they'll get more supply. Um, you have to also increase the port here and to here. Um, supply always takes a route, so it might not necessarily be one tile. Like, if this was a level, like, if you were getting low supply in Mosland, when you're up against the um, French, and, like, this is a level seven, but the level behind it's three. That could be the thing that's causing the issue. Again, it's good to always check the supply tab here, and you can see the different levels of supply you'll get in different areas by mousing over certain tiles and knowing where it'll show you where the supply is going, how it's getting there, and the supply level you're going to be able to get. And again, mousing over it, you can read the information. It'll tell you what's going on there. Um, land forts are going to give a negative penalty for 15% per fort. So you can go up to 10 in comp games. We cap it at seven because it can get kind of cancerous. Um, coastal forts, we don't allow you to build in comp games because naval invasions is already difficult and this just makes it impossible nearly. Um, these are only good for against naval invasions while these are good against people that are attacking. If you put a land fort on a coastal tile and the naval invade, it will negate the ability of the land fort, just so you know. And, uh, here... Minimize and expand. Well, this you can convert factories. So you convert one mill factory to sieves or one sieve to a mill. I've never done this. I, I, if this is good, I guess it's not my thing. Um, okay, construction. On to production. So, so you can see here the amount of resources that we have at the top, just for quick reference, as well as the amount of output. So dockyard output, factory output, our production efficiency cap, our retention, our growth, and our factory bomb vulnerability, all of which I showed you can be buffed with your different industry research. Now, switch this back to this. We're going to use more production. Okay. So now you can see that we have factories to assign. You can see we've only assigned 20 out of 28. Let's just, we're going to need some of these. Let's see these. Uh, let's put some more fighters. I, re I don't really want to make light tanks. We're going to have enough in stockpile. Use that. I don't like medium bombers. We'll produce that. German Navy is stupid. And you always want to be producing convoys. I would say if you're a nation that, you know, is trading a ton or elite decently, you should always have 5 to 15 dockyards on convoys at all times, period. Um, this is not how I would start a comp game, by the way. This is just me putting random shit on random shit. Um, again, you can build different things from your infantry, artillery equipment areas. Pretty self-explanatory. Same with your armored vehicles and aircraft. It's important to know that you can change the level of, um, or the ability of a certain type. So let's say I wanted to create a variant. Now, with planes, the meta is always to go engine first. You get more agility. It's going to help you win fight, fights better. After you go engine, you get that all the way to five. Then you would go range. Then you would go weapons. Then you would go reliability, which again takes a lot, but it's too expensive. So we can make one to move on. Um, for armor, you always, whoops, for armor, you always want to go armor first. So the most amount of armor so people can't pen you. Then usually main gun or engine, and then after reliability. Um, you can't really upgrade, you can upgrade those, but you can't really upgrade, uh, any of these. Oops, I put that out of equipment. There we go. So you can't really upgrade any of these at all um, and then when it goes to ships again I'm not very good with ships there's a whole process to designing ships and designing how to 
incorporate different parts of ships. I'm not going to pretend like I know enough about this to um, tell you what to do. All I the very few things that I know is that you really want to have good spotting, which is these catapults and sonar on a lot of your cruisers and a lot of depth charges on subs or su um, destroyers to counter subs. And your subs, you want to have good snorkels and good torpedoes. And then your carriers just want to have max deck space. That's all I know. There's obviously a bigger meta to that. Again, this is just a little bit that I know about Navy. Um, you also see your Naval Repair queue and what is being queued up to repair. So now, um, really all you need to know about production. Um, recruit and deploy. Let's cover logistics first because this recruit and deploy is going to be a decent section because I have to talk about all the different stats of combat with. Logistics is basically just telling you what kit you got. Basically, what the equipment is, how much of it you're producing on a weekly basis, and how much of it you have in stockpile and what resources it costs. So basically, if someone says, how much, like, I, I am running low on guns, how many do you need? You pull up in this tab and say, oh, I'm in a deficit of, like, if this was a negative number, if this was red, this would be like, oh, I'm in a deficit of, like, 14k guns. Like, if I were to do something yeah. stupid, like, a herring tank, and I were to click this. We're in a deficit of 5,000 and a half tanks right now, as well as 2.2 thousand motorized and 49 support equipment. Not good. So I would probably want to change all these. Ah. We'll be back to infantry. And that would mean put me in a deficit of guns because we lost some in there. Oh, nope, we're fine now. I thought we even lost some during the switch. But regardless. That is your logistics tab. It's very simplistic. It shows you just basically what you got, how much weight you're producing. Now, division templates. One of the most important parts of Hoi 4 is making sure your division templates go within a multiple of 10. Either 10, 20, or 40 width. Not 30 width, because that doesn't mix well within anything that the 40 division, the, the 40 width tiles come into. So, um, the standard division template is a 7 2. With, and then without support, it would look like this. This is a 7-2. 7 infantry, 2 artillery. It doesn't matter where the artillery is. They could be over here, up there, down there, at your mama's house, whatever. Like, if they are in this template right here, and it's 20 width, it's a 7-2, it's, it's a good, decent division. They can attack pretty well. They won't have as high as defense uh, if you did a full 20 width. If it's just infantry... They'll have better defense. However, a good 7-2 would look like this. Now, a good offensive division is called a 14-4, which you can probably guess from what I've told you before that it would look like this. 14-4, 14 infantry, 4 artillery, just like that. Um, this would be a good attacking division. Um, it basically gives you more soft attack. Again, you would might want to switch one of these out with a anti-tank to get some... Um, piercing and heart attack, that way you can come into contact and defeat some of those tank divisions. Um, but again, you always want to make sure it's 40 width. Um, as you can see, the HP and organization. Right now, as you can see, if I were to add some of these support companies, they, it would lower the amount of organization. But when you get some of those bonuses, like I showed you in um, the superior firepower, you will get more and more bonuses to your organization, and it will do less debuffs for the support companies that you get. Um, if I talk about some of the support companies, you only have five. Um, engineers always gonna have in any division, really. Um, just better defense. When it comes to recon, cavalry won't make you produce anything weird, while motorized will make you produce motorized recon. It's a little bit better than cavalry. Light armored recon um, is good. You will need to produce armored cars, and armored recon, you produce light tanks. You can't switch this over to being medium tank recon, but it will actually this is a legal way to give your division five armor. Won't really do anything, but it'll give your division five armor. But again, you have to produce light tanks. They're not cheap. So generally, with normal divisions, I like to spam out. Cavalry recon attachment does it. Um, and then some. Just this just is more artillery, more soft attack, more hard attack. You know, not bad. Um, this right here will basically make you um, make the AI either equip it less often normally or equip it first so basically when new infantry equipment is produced it'll be sent to this unit first if it needs it um that's what a good infantry division looks like you can also make a really defensible 40 width division but those get a little bit hard to manage and usually take a lot of attrition um so good division templates for defense are usually 20 width now i talked about before 
that if you have um, the oh, what's it called the um, mass assault doctrine and you go to one of those paths that gives you either side has it where it gives you a negative 0.4 per, um, 0.4 per infantry division width this is going to be a 40 width because for every one, two, three, four divisions, it gets rid of one. So one, two, three. So it's going to get rid of basically this entire row down here. It's going to be basically not existent to the width. It's going to get rid of its width. So this will be a 40 width, but it will have the stats of a 50 width. So for Russia, building some of these like just meat divisions sometimes can be really beneficial for an insane amount of defense, especially when you start throwing stuff in like engineer companies. Like that defense just went up even higher. Um, and other things like that will make the defense go up higher. This will make the defense, I think, yeah, this will make it pretty high here. This will make it higher than the tanks. The artillery will make it like 600, and I don't even have like bonuses right now for my doctrine. Like, that's just there. Um, now, uh, for, let me tag, because I'm just having Marines. Now, Marine templates. You always want to have your marine templates be a division that can break through things. Um, and I like to make my marine templates 14-4. And they can kind of look whatever way they want to look so long as they're 14-4. The look doesn't really matter as much. And then I like to have the motorized recon, support artillery, and then logistics and the signal companies. Um... And that gives the Marines a really good bonus. The artillery will have a negative attack on like rivers and amphibious attack, but with the amount of Marines in the division, it will allow you to counteract that. Um, good paratroop divisions are usually just 20 width straight paratroopers because they're not really made for attacking. You, um, and if you put a division in a paratrooper division that can't be paratrooped, it's not going to be good. It's you can't paratroop it then. Um, the divisions in paratrooper divisions have to all be paratroopers. The support can be whatever you want, but the divisions in the center have to be paratroopers, or you can't paradrop paradrop it. Um, marine brig or not marine brigades. Uh, defensive brigades usually you want to go with a straight ten width. That way you can just set them out easily. And then, um, oops, I usually like change the thing of them so they're like a little bit different, so I can see them. You put them on low equipment priority, and you also give them military police and then make sure to also change your occupied territories to have that garrison brigade be the main type so you're producing that and not some random thing where like you're producing you change your 40 width template and it's making your 40 width template your garrison template it'll have great suppression but it's gonna it's gonna be expensive um got to go back to germany for tanks um, tank divisions, you always want to have 30 org at the least. So let's say just for this, um, excuse me. Oh, also I figured something for to talk about with tanks. You always want to have two full lines of tanks when you're doing a 40 width. If you do 20 width tanks, are not as effective. Usually I, I would just stick with 40 widths. Um, always want to remember this. So I think once you would get some bonuses, so this is 40 width right here. It has 30 orcs. This is what you want to go with. This might change because you have some of these bonuses here. And once you get superior power, superior firepower, this organization will be a little higher and you could afford to go like this, which would give you more offensive stats. However, um, your tanks also, you can trade these two out with something different. I forgot to mention this in tanks for the research. Tanks also have three different versions of themselves. The regular version, as well as, let's just bring this up, the anti-tank version, the self-propelled artillery version, and then the anti-air version. So the anti-tank version is a gives you a massive bonus to your piercing and hard attack, but it's gonna have far less soft attack, like less than half. For heavy SP artillery, again, self-propelled artillery, the soft attack is going to be tremendous, but this is what is terrible. That armor is just is just chunked, which is the best thing when having a tank is the armor, the ability to reduce the amount of damage that's incoming. Same with the SPAA. A lot of people use SPAA when um, they play Russia to get a lot of that um, air that Germany has over them down. 
However, it even has the same amount of armor, 45, rather than the 70 armor of these other two divisions. Or, uh, battalions, I guess I should say. So, I generally like to put these in my divisions, if anything, of other tank types, just because I think they're phenomenal when going into tank-to-tank -tank combat, which is happens a lot in comp games. Um... You can also do some weird things, like I've experimented with doing an 8-8. Eight, eight. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it's a 40 width. The only problem is that you need infantry to support it because it's such low org. This is an artillery division, quote-unquote. It's going to have massive soft attack. It's going to be really good for pushing infantry divisions back, but it's very low org. Um, you generally want your Mountaineer divisions to be 14-4 or pure 40 width just because they're very good at what they do and if you reduce the amount of uh, ability to have on Mountain it's not going to be as beneficial for them um, so people also use Cav divisions 10 with Cav divisions or 20 with Cav divisions as their garrison um, yeah um, as you can see here you can also set um, the priority, so you want your operations to have the highest priority of equipment, or your garrisons to have the highest priority, or your upgrades or your reinforcements to have this priority, whatever. Um, yeah, that's the entire recruit and deploy tab. Um, let's go over some of these upper tabs here. We'll go over um, some of the actually mechanics of air combat, and we already went over some micro, um, and I think after that, that should... Just some other minor things. I'll show you some quick tool tips and stuff. That should be it. Um, so, political power. Um, you gain political power passively, and there can be buffs to this. Your stability, again, will give you a buff to your political power, as well as your leader in this case. This guy is giving me 25% extra political power. Um, while the MIFO bills, which is a national spirit, are reducing my political power by making it cost more. Um, if you do a, um, national focus, it's going to decrease the amount you have. So again, you can see here, I'm losing one political power for this national focus. Always the same. It's always one political power for, uh, focuses. Continuous focuses might take more. I don't think they do, but they should be about the same. Um, stability is very important to have. If you have good stability, you will gain buffs from it. Um, as far as extra political power gain, more factory and dockyard output, um, less resistance in occupied territories, and your consumer goods are decreased. Um, you get stability passively from your ruling party popularity. So if we had more party popularity, we'd have more stability. Your war support um, is beneficial for your country in its mobilization speed and its surrender limit. We don't have a lot right now. We're under 50. 50 is that make or break to debuff or buff point. So we're losing... We don't have enough mobilization speed, um, like our our manpower won't get to our units as quickly. Our surrender limit's lower, and our daily command power gain isn't as high. If it's above 50, we'll be in good shape. Um, manpower, again, we kind of talked about this with each state. You get a certain recruitable population percentage of each, and this is the total amount of manpower that is eligible for the army that you can use. Um, again, I kind of covered that. Uh, this one's self-explanatory. The military factors you have, the amount of mills, and no, the amount of factories in general is up there. Well, you can see in this screen the amount of military, naval factories, and civilian factories you have in separate. We talked about fuel. Convoys, it shows how many convoys you have, um, the number that you're using, the number for naval invasion or battle plans, for transferring troops, for trade, and the remaining unused, which is 165, which is the number that will be displayed at the top here. Your command power is important for upgrading generals, which I'll talk about mm -hmm. now. Generals and their upgrades are very important. Um, the way generals work is, is that whatever plan is going on will be using that general and, and its abilities. So if you get into combat with the general, it will use the general's abilities and his different um, buffs, which the buffs are uh, attack, defense, skill, and supply consumption. So this will basically give you more attack, more defense, more planning speed and max planning, and then less supply consumption for each. Each general has a different ability in each. They also have different buffs for each. We'll go over those in a second. But if we are to take, like, let's say, the main German army, we're to assign them a random guy. Let's just go with Von Brock, because he's very good at offense. And we're also to assign... Oh, that's, a, that's a random one. And then we're also to assign a field marshal, which you want to do. And we pick, let's say, Von Krug. 
and we assign them if we assign them with the general only the general's traits will be used but if we assign them with the field marshal the field marshal will use his abilities and the generals now you click this the front line you click a territory it will place the front line on there as you can see it has the purple which is the color of the field marshal and the orange which is the color of the general that means both buffs will be used if you were to have multiple right, so armies like if i were to take these random yahoos to put them in an army with rommel and put them down on this bar which means they're under the jurisdiction of von klug and to do this then you can see that for a certain portion up here you're able to see that there's the pink which means that in this section it'll be using rommel's buffs as well as von klug's buffs however if i click this and i hold shift and then put it down it's only using von klug's buffs meaning that he's can taking control of all the units here and these generals are not doing as much this is good for massive fronts because the armies won't flip flop around and get crossed up and move because a lot of times that happens. And if you do that on Barbarossa and you push somewhere, all of a sudden your armies will start flip flopping and guys from down here will run up here and guys from up here will run down there because the AI in Hoi 4 is badly coded and doesn't know what to do. Um, so you kind of have to counteract that and use it how you will. Talking about generals, a lot of people ask me this when they come to um, field marshals. I don't think this one guy has any. So... You can also promote people to field marshal. I love promoting uh, Menstein. So, Menstein, he's a field marshal. <laughs> the reason I promote him is I love brilliant strategists. You can get aggressive assaults for and offensive doctrine. That's an extra 10% breakthrough, 1% attack. It's good for just, just attacking people. So, usually I take both of these, and then they're like, oh, but wait, what if I want, like, Fortress Buster? That's a general trait. If the field marshal is being used as a field marshal, as Menstein is here, he can't use that. But you can use the field marshal traits. This works inversely. If Manstein is being used like in Rommel's position, he cannot use these field marshal traits. He can only use the general traits. So make sure you're well aware of that when you click things and assign generals because you can't undo that. Um, they do require the command power to use, and you obviously will continue to get man or command power as you go along. So don't worry about it. But. Um, it's very beneficial to use it in the right way. Um, some of the best buffs you want to get, um, depending on what you're wanting to do. For Field Marshal, Logistic Wizard is great. Less supply consumption. Any of these four appear great, depending on what you want to do. Um, max Entrenchment's great. Extra Defense is great. Again, I showed your Breakthrough and Attack is great. Also, don't or don't underestimate the organization loss when moving. It gives your units a better defensive capability when you're pushing into enemy territory. And Reinforce Rate and Recovery Rate. Reinforced rate allows units to get up to the front when they're in that reserve spot in the little battles quicker, while the recovery rate allows them to regain their health quicker when they're out of combat. The biggest thing you want to get for a general or a field marshal is this. This is the gold, this is the pinnacle of Hoi 4 generalship is getting adaptable. It reduces the amount of terrain penalties because different terrains will have different penalties when you attack. For instance, if I were to click this terrain... It's grasslands, it's fine. If I were to click urban, you get a, an attack of 70% instead of the normal 100. Um, again, there's another tile. Let's go to like a mountain tile. Um, it's a hill tile. So your attack is reduced, enemy air support is reduced. Um, forest tile attacks a little bit reduced, enemy air is reduced. Where's the mountains? Go to the Alps. There's a mountain. Look at that. Extra division attrition, extra division, less division attack, enemy air support's decreased. Like, movement cost when going through this terrain is two times. Um, there's also, like, jungle. Go to the classic jungle. F uh, forest. Where's jungle? Jungle. What? Forest. Okay. Uh, hill, 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 hill. There's gotta be jungles here. There he is. Jungle. Like, look at all those debuffs. It's also rain, huge amount of debuffs, extremely hot, huge amount of debuffs. Adaptable is going to help you reduce, reduce that terrainity, t t t uh, terrain penalty reduction. Um, these You need two of these terrain traits to get to Adaptable. A lot of Soviet generals will have Winter Expert, so if you can get them like Mountaineer or Hill Fighter in Spain, you can get Adaptable pretty quick. Um, Desert Fox is good for North Africa. Swamp Fox is good for Southeast Asia. Hill and Mountaineer are good for fighting through some of the Alp regions. Urban Assault Specialist is just, you know, good when you're attacking cities, which is important for some areas. Ranger, Forest, there's a lot of forest everywhere. It's very good in general. 
Um, oh, swamps and jungles are different. Sorry, jungle rats do different down there. Swamps. There's actually a big swamp in the middle of uh, Soviet Russia, right here. And swamps are horrendous. They are terrible for units. So swamp, swamp foxes is very good to have. And winter specialists and winter experts are very nice to have for a lot of units that are going to be fighting up in the very cold areas. Um, <clears throat> so these earned traits, you have to earn them through fighting. Um, organizer um, is using battle plans that'll help you earn that one. Panzer leader is using divisions that are mostly um, over 40% armor ratio. Cav, over 40% cav. Engineer attacking over um, rivers and into forts, either or. Infantry leader, over 80% infantry. Invader, you have to be naval invading in order to get bonus and like points for this. Um, you have to get points for a commando when you're out of supply. Um, if you're using para drop or if you have um, the naval penalty modifier and trickster if you're attacking from different locations at the same time and skilled staffer if usually this is only for field marshals um, if you get skilled staffer um, when he's a general he can have I think uh, up to 30 units in the army or if he's an expert delegator when you can upgrade it from that to a field marshal he can have two extra people in his army so this will go from two out of five to two out of seven. Those are the general traits um, you can get from earned for the regular general traits. Panzer Expert is to uh, better armor division defense and especially better blitz and encirclement tactics chances to pop up, which are phenomenal. I would recommend this for any of your tank leaders. Combat Arms Expert are good for motorized or mechanized, and Cavalry is good for Cavalry defense. This is really good if you use Cavalry for your defense in a lot of um, guarding against naval invasions. Fortress Buster is amazing and still insanely broken. Um, you can actually, I remember I had, I used von Menstein with engineer and I had, where is he? I had this guy right here, Henrique, and I assigned him Fort Buster as well. And I attacked with Marines over this tile here to Amiens. It was a planes movement and there was a level 10 fort there. And I had a positive bonus to attack because they were Marines attacking over a river, which gave them a positive bonus, and it also was attacking with Fort Buster across the tile. To activate Fort Buster, it's one of these motions up here that will cause you to use extra command power. There's Last Stand, or Force Attack, which will give you extra offense and breakthrough. Um, <clears throat> well, it causes you to take more damage, and you will also... Um, you can't retreat when you attack. Um, this one is Last Stand. It's kind of like a Force Attack, but a Last Stand, meaning that a little... Give your units more of a defense and entrenchment. Um, staff office plan will increase your planning speed greatly. And then this spot would be for other special bonuses that you would get through promoting your generals to different areas. Um, infantry expert is great for division attack. Um, and ambush sugar is better. It's actually for defense, believe it or not. You get more max entrenchment and a better recon bonus when you're entrenched. Um... Scavenger would give you better equipment capture. Um, these are really good for naval invaders like America. Amphibious, not as good as I like naval liaison. That shore bombardment bonus, basically, if you have a fleet on naval bombardment support, they will allow you to get a bonus to attack when you naval invade or when you're fighting combat near the coast. This would give you a bonus to that naval bonus. So bonus on top of a bonus, it's good. Um, skirmisher allows you to probing attack, which makes you lose less entrenchment when you attack. Paratroopers give you extra, like, supply when you paradrop, which is really good. Camouflage Expert is a good, but also bad, because it gives you less damage from their cast, but your cast does less damage. So, if you're playing Russia, this is great, because, you know, you don't use your building casts if you're doing no way in Russia. Um, Improvisation Expert I love, because it gives you extra movement bonus on land, but you have to have at least one land trait to get it. And Guerrilla Fighter gives you extra entrenchment speed. Um... So yeah, those are all of the traits you can get for your field marshals or generals. Um, army experience you can use to increase your armor or your army divisions, and you also use it to upgrade your tanks. Um, naval XP you use to upgrade your ships in this tab by putting different um, modules on your ships, while the air experience is the same thing, creating different air types for your fighters, close air support, whatnot. Um, yeah, we're getting through most of it. Um, you can see world tension here. The date of which world tension was increased by what nation. Countries that increased it. Um, just the amount of world tension. It's just different sortings and also the current wars that are going on. 
You click this tab, you can also click this button and it goes to the miners. So basically who needs to capitulate before the war is over when it's a bigger war. This is a civil war, so it doesn't really matter. You can also turn off and on capitulated nations and nations that can be called into the war. You can see here the war participation percentage, the amount of divisions they have, the industry, and the amount of casualties they have. And so the casualty, you can see who's been causing the casualties. Volunteers don't count towards causing casualties because they're considered part of the army of the nation that's fighting with them. You'll see this current tide of the war. It's who it's in the favor of. And natural space consider the aggressors here. So it's 14% in their favor. Um, here you can see your army overview, where your divisions are at, the type of divisions, the different buffs you have. Same with your navy and air force. It's really good for this way to like, if you want to consolidate your navy, you can quickly take all of these sections, quickly consolidate them, and they'll go to one section. And then you can just split them up from there. There are also bonuses to admirals. Um, again, which somebody else will go over because I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. There's also um, air. There's no aces don't get bonuses, but again, you can see all the air you have here. I think I forgot. Ah, I forgot to delete planes of Konigsberg. So there we go. So again, yeah, you can see all your air. Um, I'm going to quickly go over the different types of air abilities. Um, let me actually go over them. Not my. Let's get a plane. Again, they should always be in level of 100 unless they're carrier planes or anything. Just because they're very... Um, if you use... You'll, you'll, you'll get lost if you use one. While groups of 100 are very... is a nice number to use, and it's very... Um, it fits in a lot of areas. You can select different units. Like, if these were 100, I could select these two and send them to this one while leaving that one there. But... You want your fighter planes to be on air superiority and interception to get your air superiority and to intercept the amount of uh, the enemy planes coming to that location. Um, pilot exercises are good for just getting air experience, but it does require a lot of um, fuel. Close air support is going to be good for your close air support. Again, doing damage to your units on the ground. Your bombers will be able to do close air support, but also strategic bombing. And you always want to click this after and, f and click what you want it to target specifically. Infrastructure to reduce the amount of... Um, Supply troops are getting, so you can like target a capital, reduce infrastructure. The infrastructure has to come from the capital, therefore they're getting low supply because the capital has low infrastructure. Military factories, civilian factories. Um, if you target an enemy's air bases and their air bases are no longer available to hold the amount of planes that they need to get out in the air, eventually you'll just win the air war if you can destroy their air bases because they can't launch any planes. Um, dockyards, forts, naval forts, um, or not dockyards, naval bases, dockyards, um, anti-air, you also have um, refineries, fuel silos, radar, um, and you also have rocket silos and uh, industry or nuclear production plants. Um, you can also naval strike. You can port strike. You can also kamikaze if you have the ability to. Usually it's through national focuses. Air supply, which is through these really special planes, which I don't think enough people use, which are transport planes. Air supply will give you the cost or will give you um, supply to a region without using infrastructure. It will airdrop supply in. It costs command power, depending on the amount of planes you're using, but it's very beneficial. Um, and it can, they can be shot down and hit by AA, so worry about that. Um, we don't allow mines in our game because they usually lag out the game because the game codes them weird because they're individual entities. But if you want to lay mines in a single-player game, you can naval mine lay or you can mine sweep. And then you can also um, use air recon for some of your scout planes. Um, you can also set when your planes will go, either only in the day, only in the night, in both, and also if they don't retreat, they not oper operate normally, low intensity. Um, so I just always keep them in no retreat. They'll always fly. They'll always get you know repaired, or they'll always get like reinforced. Um, if you want to increase the amount of planes normally, you can click this button here and just adjust them from here. So let's make this a hundred. It'll get reinforced, and you can also assign. Aces, which will give you um, <clears throat> certain levels of bonuses to base, based on what it is. So I believe this means he can only be assigned to types of fighter and interceptors. So there goes Eric Hartman, and now he will give us those selected bonuses you see there. Agility, again, very good. Um, you can also split the amount of air, um, planes. Like if you have a ton of planes, I'll usually deploy 800, then split it a couple times so it gets into eight groups of 100, which is an easy way to deploy a ton of planes at once. Um, you can also hold air wings. Like if you want to paradrop and you're doing this, you are you're you can't paradrop because these planes are used to paradrop. 
and they are currently on a mission. So you have to hold them and click them off that, and then they can paradrop from that airport or be used to paradrop the paratroopers. Um, yep, and you can also merge air wings. So let's, you actually separate two 100s. You click both of them, you merge them into a group of 100. Um... Ah, uh, I think that's it for planes right there. It's about, I think, all you need to know for that. Um, some of the map tiles you can see down here. A lot of people I see don't use this. This little mini map here, you can control M or click it, and it'll bring up this where you can click on the map, drag it around, and it'll allow you to go to anywhere. Default map mode where you see infantry. Naval map mode where you see naval zones and your ships. Strategic air map where you see different pieces of um, information for your air. You can also click on different tiles and see the air war that's going on. Um, do something when it comes to air. Let's click this. You can see the air combat when it goes on as well. So as you can see, this is important thing to look at when you're in air con. You want to see how many enemy planes you are shooting down, how many of yours are getting shot down. In this case, it's zero to two. It's great. We're not losing any planes. We're killing all their planes. Um, our damage to enemy divisions is 0.7. And friendly planes disrupted is about 0%. This is, again, we're winning hand over fist right here. You can also use command power to increase um, a 10% efficiency boost to this air zone here. So we do this, we lose that amount, and it's going to even help us get a higher and higher level here uh, by a little bit. I think we're already winning heavily enough, so it won't really matter as much. I think we also have to have ground troops in the region for it to be fully right. active. They might move in their planes out of the region too once they see this happening. Um, yeah, but that's again the air mode, and then you can also see the the operatives map mode. So you can see what your operatives are doing, the level of counterintelligence you have. If this shield starts changing color, it means enemies are doing stuff in your territory. That means you know get somebody on um, counterintelligence. Uh, Supply areas, I showed you before, how it shows you where supply is going to, and you can also use this territory to build upgrades in different territories through infrastructure or dockyards, or uh, naval bases, I should say. Terrain, I like the look of this map. I think this is the, I think if I could create a default map that looked like this, I would, because I think this looks really cool, but um, it just shows the terrain in different areas. There actually are different terrains, different waters. Um, fjords and archipelagos, shallow sea, ocean, deep ocean. Um, shallow sea, you know, a fjord, and there's, of course, archipelagos. These are also shark-infested waters, so casualties upon the sink are going to kind of increase there, so watch out for it. Deep oceans. Ocean. To see. Arctic water. Yeah, there's different buffs for different naval zones. They added that with, um, the guns. Um... Then you also have resistance map mode. You can see the amount of resistance in your territory. You can also, again, as I showed you before, early in the video, you can see that through your Q tab. Compliance, resistance and compliance again. Resources, you can see the amount of resources. It's kind of like your trade tab without the big trade thing in the way. Um, you can zoom in and see different areas where there's a bunch of uh, oil and other resources. Um, the infrastructure map mode will tell you where there's a ton of infrastructure and that's gonna give you more supply for units. As you can see, a lot of infrastructure in these really well-developed areas, not a lot, some more dilapidated and poor areas even like in america the coasts are pretty and the central areas are pretty well developed in this middle areas like you know wyoming again doesn't exist there's no infrastructure factions you can see which people are in what factions really comes more in handy during meme games when you don't know what kind of you know bullshit people are doing uh players you can see um oh toggle displays um so basically you can see um, whose units are whose with this. Um, if you are in the faction with somebody else and you... Oh, this is the right one. I think this is just players. Toggle displaying unit counters between other players. Oh, that's what that does. Okay. Um, this basically doesn't show the enemy's units with markers. So you can just get rid of that and only see yours. I don't know why I want to do that, but you can. Um... This toggles the color between um, the units to a certain allegiance. So instead of them all being gray, like I usually have them, or like blue if they're allied, gray if they're neutral, and red if they're enemy, this uh, this makes them the color of their flag. 
which I don't like. I don't know why a lot of people do like it. This button is great for when you're playing with friends because you can see if they're in your faction, what plans they're doing. And as I can see here, this is Franco's plan to invade central Spain. So I can see what he's doing and kind of help him out with that. Um, I'll always keep this off. I'm not even gonna turn it on. This is the day night cycle. If you turn that on, um, uninstall, uh, yeah. Then fog of war. Display fog of war. Ah, uh, I don't. I honestly don't know what that does. I've never seen fog of war in the game. I've never turned that on, so it's interesting. And this shows radar stations and what they're using. Um, if I like, I think it's tag Brazil, not Britain. Oops. Uh, if I tag England, I guess. You can see then if I turn this on, you can see the different radar stations being used, and I turn it off. You can see. Also, pinging is really important. Um, you can click these buttons on the map if you pull it out and um, click different areas and it will ping. Or this is Control Alt Shift click for an attack ping, or Control Alt click for a defensive ping. Um, you can also see other different map modes here, the different states, um, and this will also show the amount of slots that they have. So this is a. Um, dense urban region this is a megapolis region developed rural region rural region rural region and this is like rural rural yeah this if they this type of reason these are impassable wastelands um different supply areas resistance compliance resources diplomacy between these for nations the factions some of these are we are going through players for meme games it's really nice infrastructure Population, which is nice to see where you want to target for coring again. These are really big areas. Um, why I, again, I kind of showed this before, why Japan wants to go with that 2% non-core manpower is because of that. Um, ideology and then terrain. Um, so yeah, I'm sure I haven't covered everything. Um, I'm sure there's some other things that definitely need to be addressed in this video as far as what um, other people need to know about Hoi. Um, I'm thinking about also starting a big Google Doc so we can start to make our own guide kind of based off the guide we've been using and other guides for a more modern day relaxed, um, not relaxed, but a more modern day competitive guide um, that we can use to help out a lot of new people because the guide we currently use is kind of starting to get a little dated. So anyway, thank you guys for watching. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you for staying through about a couple hours of this video. Um, Get out there, play some experiment. Always try to be learn more about the game, um, and I guarantee it will eventually start to make more and more sense until you know what you're doing day in and day out. Good luck, and I'll see you guys out there.